Victoria.
Director Comey, I appreciate your willingness to appear before the committee today, and more importantly, I thank you for your dedicated service and leadership to the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Your appearance today speaks to the trust we have built over the years, and I'm looking forward to a very open and candid discussion today. I'd like to remind my colleagues that we will reconvene in closed session at 1 p.m. today, and I ask that you reserve for that venue any questions that might get into classified information. For his commitment to be on the Hill, so we will do everything we can to meet that agreement. The Senate Select Committee on Intelligence exists to certify for the other 85 members of the United States Senate and the American people that the intelligence community is operating lawfully and has the necessary authorities and tools to accomplish its mission and keep America safe. Part of our mission, beyond the oversight we continue to provide to the intelligence community and its activities, is Russian interference in the 2016 U.S. elections. The committee's work continues. This hearing represents part of that effort. Jim, allegations have been swirling in the press for the last several weeks, and today's your opportunity to set the record straight. Yesterday, I read with interest your statement for the record, and I think it provides some helpful details surrounding your interactions. I read with interest your statement for the record, and I think it provides some helpful details surrounding your interactions with the President, conversation, and your state of mind. 
I very much appreciate your candor. I very much appreciate your candor. I think it's helpful as we work through to determine the ultimate truth behind possible Russian interference in the 2016 elections. Your statement also provides texture and context to your interactions with the president <clears throat> from your vantage point and outlines a strained relationship. The American people need to hear your side of the story just as they need to hear the president's descriptions of events. These interactions also highlight the importance of the committee's ongoing investigation. Our experienced staff is interviewing all relevant parties and some of the most sensitive intelligence in our country's possession. We will establish the facts, separate from rampant speculation, and lay them out for the American people to make their own judgment. Only then will we, as a nation, be able to move forward and to put this episode to rest. There are several outstanding issues not addressed in your statement that I hope you'll clear up for the American people today. Did the President's request for loyalty, your impression, that, uh, that the one-on-one -on -one dinner of January 27th was, and I quote, at least in part, an effort to create some sort of patronage relationship, or is March 30th phone call asking uh, what you could do to lift the cloud of Russia investigation in any way, alter your approach or the FBI's investigation into General Flynn, or the broader investigation into Russia and possible links to the campaign? In your opinion, did potential Russian efforts to establish links with the individuals in the Trump orbit rise to the level we could define as collusion, or was it a counterintelligence concern? There's been a significant public speculation about your decision making related to the Clinton email investigation. Why did you decide publicly uh, to publicly announce FBI's recommendations that the Department of Justice not pursue criminal charges? You have described it as a choice between a bad decision and a worse decision. The American people need to understand the facts behind your action. This committee is uniquely suited to investigate Russia's interference in the 2016 elections. We also have a, a unified bipartisan approach to what is a highly charged partisan issue. Russian activities during 2016 election may have been aimed at one party's candidate, but as my colleague Senator Rubio says frequently, in 2018 and 2020, it could be aimed at anyone at home or abroad. My colleague Senator Warner and I have worked in, have worked to stay in lockstep on this investigation. We've had our differences on approach at times, but I've constantly stressed that we need to be a team, and I think Senator Warner agrees with me. We must keep these questions above politics and partisanship. It's too important to be tainted by anyone trying to score political points. With that, again, I welcome you, Director, and I turn to the Vice Chairman for any comments he might have. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me start by, again, absolutely thanking all the members of the committee for the seriousness in which they've taken on this task. Mr. Comey, thank you for agreeing to come testify as part of this committee's investigation into Russia. I realize that this hearing has been, obviously, the focus of a lot of Washington in the last few days. But the truth is, many Americans who may be tuning in today probably haven't focused on every twist and turn of the investigation. So I'd like to briefly describe, at least from this Senator's standpoint, what we already know and what we're still investigating. To be clear, this investigation is not about relitigating the election. It's not about who won or lost, and it sure as heck is not about Democrats versus Republicans. We're here because a foreign adversary attacked us right here at home, plain and simple, not by guns or missiles, but by foreign operatives seeking to hijack our most important democratic process, our presidential election. Russian spies engaged in a series of online cyber raids and a broad campaign of disinformation, all ultimately aimed at sowing chaos to undermine public faith in our process 
in our leadership, and ultimately in ourselves. And that's not just this senator's opinion. It is the unanimous determination of the entire U.S. intelligence community. So we must find out the full story. What the Russians did, and candidly, as some other colleagues have mentioned, why they were so successful. And more importantly, we must determine the necessary steps to take to protect our democracy and ensure they can't do it again. Chairman mentioned elections in 2018 and 2020. In my home state of Virginia, we have elections this year in 2017. Simply put, we cannot let anything or anyone prevent us from getting to the bottom of this. Now, Mr. Comey, let me say at the outset, we haven't always agreed on every issue. In fact, I've occasionally questioned some of the actions you've taken. But I've never had any reason to question your integrity, your expertise, or your intelligence. You've been a straight shooter with this committee and have been willing to speak truth to power, even at the risk of your own career, which makes the way in which you were fired by the President ultimately shocking. Recall we began this entire process with the President and his staff first denying that the Russians were ever involved and then falsely claiming that no one from his team was ever in touch with any Russians. We know that's just not the truth. Numerous Trump associates had undisclosed contacts with Russians before and after the election, including the President's Attorney General, his former National Security Advisor, and his current senior advisor, Mr. Kushner. That doesn't even begin to count the host of additional campaign associates and advisors who've also been caught up in this massive web. We saw Mr. Trump's campaign manager, Mr. Manafort, forced to step down over ties to Russian-backed entities. The National Security Advisor, General Flynn, had to resign over his lies about engagements with the Russians. And we saw the candidate himself express an odd and unexplained affection for the Russian dictator while calling for the hacking of his opponent. There's a lot to investigate. Enough, in fact, that then-Director Comey publicly acknowledged that he was leading an investigation into those links between Mr. Trump's campaign and the Russian government. As the director of the FBI, Mr. Comey was ultimately responsible for conducting that investigation, which might explain why you're sitting now as a private citizen. What we didn't know was at the same time that this investigation was proceeding, the president himself appears to have been engaged in an effort to influence or at least co-opt the director of the FBI. The testimony that Mr. Comey has submitted for today's hearing is very disturbing. For example, on January 27th, after summoning Director Comey to dinner, the president appears to have threatened the director's job while telling him, quote, I need loyalty. I expect loyalty. At a later meeting on February 14th, the president asked the attorney general to leave the Oval Office so that he could privately ask Director Comey, again, quote, to see way clear to letting Flynn go. That is a statement that Director Comey interpreted as a, as a request that he drop the investigation connected to General Flynn's false statements. Think about it. The President of the United States asking the FBI director to drop an ongoing investigation. And after that, the President called the FBI director on two additional occasions, March 30th and April 11th, and asked him again, quote, to lift the cloud on the Russian investigation. Now, Director Comey denied each of these improper requests. The loyalty pledge, the admonition to drop the Flynn investigation, the request to lift the cloud on the Russian investigation. Of course, after his refusals, Director Comey was fired. The initial explanation for the firing didn't pass any smell test. Somehow, Director Comey was fired because he didn't treat Hillary Clinton appropriately. Of course, that explanation lasted about a day because the President himself then made very clear that he was thinking about Russia when he decided to fire Director Comey. 
Shockingly, reports suggest that the President admitted as much in an Oval Office meeting with the Russians the day after Director Comey was fired. Disparaging our country's top law enforcement official as a quote unquote nut job, the President allegedly suggested that his firing relieved great pressure on his feelings about Russia. This is not happening in isolation. At the same time the President was engaged in these efforts with Director Comey, he was also, at least allegedly, asking senior leaders of the intelligence community to downplay the Russian investigation or to intervene with the Director. Yesterday, we had DNI Director Coates and NSA Director Admiral Rogers, who were offered a number of opportunities to flatly deny those press reports. They expressed their opinions, but they did not take that opportunity to deny those reports. They did not take advantage of that opportunity. In my belief, that's not how the President of the United States should behave. Regardless of the outcome of our investigation into the Russia links, Director Comey's firing and his testimony raise separate and troubling questions that we must get to the bottom of. Again, as I said at the outset, I've seen firsthand how seriously every member of this committee is taking his work. I'm proud of the committee's efforts so far. But let me be clear. This is not a witch hunt. This is not fake news. It is an effort to protect our country from a new threat that quite honestly will not go away anytime soon. So Mr. Comey, your testimony here today will help us move towards that goal. I look forward to that testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Vice Chairman. Uh, Director, as discussed when you agreed to appear before the committee, it would be under oath. I'd ask you to please stand, raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Please be seated. Director Comey, you're now under oath. And I would uh, just note to members, you will be recognized by seniority for a period up to seven minutes. And again, it is the intent to move to a closed session no later than 1 p.m. With that, Director Comey, you are recognized. You have the floor for as long as you might need. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ranking Member Warner, members of the committee, thank you for inviting me here to testify today. I've submitted my statement for the record, and I'm not going to repeat it here this morning. I thought I would just offer some very brief introductory remarks, and then I would welcome your questions. When I was appointed FBI director in 2013, I understood that I served at the pleasure of the president. Even though I was appointed to a 10-year term, which Congress created in order to underscore the importance of the FBI being outside of politics and independent, I understood that I could be fired by a president for any reason or for no reason at all. And on May the 9th, when I learned that I had been fired, for that reason, I immediately came home as a private citizen. But then the explanations, the shifting explanations, confused me and increasingly concerned me. They confused me because the president and I had had multiple conversations about my job, both before and after he took office. And he had repeatedly told me I was doing a great job and he hoped I would stay. And I had repeatedly assured him that I did intend to stay and serve out the remaining six years of my term. He told me repeatedly that he had talked to lots of people about me, including our current attorney general, and had learned that I was doing a great job and that I was extremely well liked by the FBI workforce. So it confused me when I saw on television the president saying that he actually fired me because of the Russia investigation and learned again from the media that he was telling privately other parties that my firing had relieved great pressure on the Russia investigation. I was also confused by the initial explanation that was offered publicly that I was fired because of the decisions I had made during the election year. That didn't make sense to me for a whole bunch of reasons, including the time and all the water that had gone under the bridge since those hard decisions that had to be made. That didn't make any sense to me. And although the law required no reason at all to fire an FBI director, the administration then chose 
to defame me and, more importantly, the FBI by saying that the organization was in disarray, that it was poorly led, that the workforce had lost confidence in its leader. Those were lies, plain and simple. And I am so sorry that the FBI workforce had to hear them, and I'm so sorry that the American people were told them. I worked every day at the FBI to help make that great organization better. And I say help because I did nothing alone at the FBI. There are no indispensable people at the FBI. The organization's great strength is that its values and abilities run deep and wide. The FBI will be fine without me. The FBI's mission will be relentlessly pursued by its people, and that mission is to protect the American people and uphold the Constitution of the United States. I will deeply miss being part of that mission, but this organization and its mission will go on long beyond me and long beyond any particular administration. I have a message before I close for the, my former colleagues of the FBI, but at first I want the American people to know this truth. The FBI is honest, the FBI is strong, and the FBI is and always will be independent. And now to my former colleagues, if I may. I am so sorry that I didn't get the chance to say goodbye to you properly. It was the honor of my life to serve beside you, to be part of the FBI family, and I will miss it for the rest of my life. Thank you for standing watch. Thank you for doing so much good for this country. Do that good as long as ever you can. And, Senators, I look forward to your questions. Director, thank you for that uh, testimony, both uh, oral and the written testimony that you provided to the committee yesterday and made public uh, to uh, the American people. Chair would recognize himself uh, first for 12 minutes, vice chair for 12 minutes, based upon the agreement we have. Director, did the special counsel's office review and or edit your written testimony? No. Do you have any doubt that Russia attempted to interfere in the 2016 elections? None. Do you have any doubt that the Russian government was behind the intrusions in the DNC and the DCCC systems and the subsequent leaks of that information? No, no doubt. Do you have any doubt that the Russian government was behind the cyber intrusion in the state voter files? No. Do you have any doubt that officials of the Russian government were fully aware of these activities? No doubt. Are you confident that no votes cast in the 2016 presidential election were altered? I'm confident. By the time when I left as director, I'd seen no indication of that whatsoever. Director Comey, did the president at any time ask you to stop the FBI investigation into Russian involvement in the 2016 U.S. elections? Not to my understanding, no. Did any individual working for this administration, including the Justice Department, ask you to stop the Russian investigation? No. Director, when the President requested that you, and I quote, let Flynn go, <coughs> General Flynn uh, had an unreported contact with the Russians, which is a, an offense. And if press accounts are right, there might have been discrepancies between facts and his FBI testimony. In your estimation, was General Flynn at that time in serious legal jeopardy? And in addition to that, do you sense that the President was trying to obstruct justice or just seek um, for a way for Mike Flynn to save face, given he had already been fired? General Flynn at that point in time was in legal jeopardy. There was an open FBI criminal investigation of his statements in connection with the Russian contacts and the contacts themselves. And so that was my assessment at the time. Uh, I don't think it's for me to say whether the conversation I had with the President was an effort to obstruct. I took it as a very disturbing thing, very concerning, but that's a conclusion I'm sure the special counsel will work towards to try and understand what the intention was there and whether that's an offense. Director, is it possible that as part of this FBI investigation, the FBI could find evidence of criminality that is not tied to the, two, to the 2016 elections, possible collusion, or coordination with Russians? Sure. 
So there could be something that just fits a criminal aspect to this that doesn't have anything to do with the 2016 election cycle. Correct. In any complex investigation, when you start turning over rocks, sometimes you find things that are Amen. unrelated to the primary investigation that are criminal in nature. Director Comey, you have been criticized publicly for the decision to present your findings on the email investigation directly to the American people. Have you learned anything since that time that would have changed what you said or how you chose to inform the American people? Honestly, no. I mean, it caused a whole lot of personal pain for me, but as I look back, given what I knew at the time and even what I've learned since, I think it was the best way to try and protect the justice institution, including the FBI. In the public uh, domain is this question of the Steele dossier, uh, a document that has been around now for over a year. Uh, I'm not sure when the FBI first took possession of it, but the media had it before you had it and I, we had it. Uh, at the time of your departure from the FBI, was the FBI able to confirm any criminal allegations contained in the Steele document? Mr. Chairman, I don't think that's a question I can answer in an open setting because it goes into the details of the investigation. Um, Director, the term we hear most often is collusion. When people are describing possible links between Americans and Russian government entities related to the interference in our election, would you say that it's normal for foreign governments to reach out to members of an incoming administration? Yes. At what point does the normal contact cross the line into an attempt to recruit agents or influence or spies? Difficult to say in the abstract. It depends upon the context, whether there's an effort to keep it covert, or what the nature of the requests made of the American by the foreign government are. It's a, it's a judgment call based on a whole lot of facts. At what point would that recruitment become a counterintelligence threat to our country? Again, difficult to answer in the abstract, but when, when a foreign power is using especially coercion or um, some sort of pressure to try and co-opt an American, especially a government official, to act on its behalf, that's a serious concern to the FBI and at the heart of the FBI's counterintelligence mission. So if you've got a 36-page document of, of specific claims that are out there, the FBI would have to, for counterintelligence reasons, try to verify uh, anything that might be claimed in there. One, and probably first and foremost, is the counterintelligence concerns that we have about blackmail. Would that be an accurate statement? Yes. If the FBI receives a credible allegation that there is some effort to co-op, coerce, direct, uh, employ covertly an American on behalf of the foreign power, that's the basis on which a counterintelligence investigation is open. And when you read the dossier, uh, what was your reaction given that it was 100 percent directed at the president-elect? Not a question I can answer in an open setting, Mr. Chairman. Okay. When did you become aware of the cyber intrusion? The first cyber, there's all kinds of cyber intrusions going on all the time. The first Russia-connected cyber intrusion uh, I became aware of in the late summer of 2015. And in that time frame, there were more than the DNC and the DCCC that were targets. Correct. There was a massive effort to target government and non-governmental, near-governmental agen agencies like uh, nonprofits. What would be the estimate of how many entities out there the Russians specifically targeted it? in that time frame? It's hundreds. I suppose it could be more than a thousand, but it's at least hundreds. When did you become aware that data had been exfiltrated? I'm not sure exactly. I think either late 15 or early 16. And did, did you, the director of the FBI, have conversations with the last administration about the risk that this posed? Yes. And share with us, if you will, what actions they took. Well, the FBI had already undertaken an effort to notify 
all the victims, and that's what we consider the entities that were attacked as part of this massive spear phishing campaign. And so we notified them in an effort to disrupt what might be ongoing. And then there was a series of continuing interactions with entities through the rest of 15 into 16. And then throughout 16, the administration was trying to decide how to respond to the intrusion activity that it saw. And the FBI, in this case, unlike other cases that you might investigate, did you ever have access to the actual hardware that was hacked? Or did you have to rely on a third party uh, to provide you the data that they had collected? In the case of the DNC, and I believe the DCCC, but I'm sure the DNC, we did not have access to the devices themselves. We got uh, relevant forensic information from a private party, a, a high-class entity that had done the work, but we didn't get direct access. But no content? Correct. Um, isn't content an important part of the forensics uh, from a counterintelligence standpoint? It is, although what was briefed to me by my folks, the people who were my folks at the time, is that they had gotten the information from the private party that they needed to understand the intrusion by the spring of 2016. Let me go back, if I can, very briefly, to the decision to publicly go out with your results on the email. Was your decision influenced by the Attorney General's tarmac meeting with the former President Bill Clinton? Yes, in, in a ultimately uh, conclusive way. That was the thing that capped it for me, that I had to do something separately to protect the credibility of the investigation, which meant both the FBI and the Justice Department. Were there other things that contributed to that that you can describe in an open session? There were other things that contributed to that. Uh, one significant item I can't, I know the committee's been briefed on. There's been some public accounts of it which are nonsense, but I understand the committee's been briefed on the classified facts. And probably the only other consideration that I guess I can talk about in an open setting is that at one point the Attorney General had directed me not to call it an investigation, but instead to call it a matter which confused me and concerned me, but that was one of the bricks in the load that led me to conclude I have to step away from the department if we're to close this case credibly. Director, my last question. Uh, you're not only a seasoned prosecutor. Uh, you've lived the FBI for years. You understand the investigative uh, process. You've worked with this committee closely, and we're grateful to you because I think we've We've mutually built trust in what your organization does and, and what we do. Is there any doubt in your mind that this committee can carry out its oversight role in the 2016 Russian involvement in the elections in parallel with the now special counsel that's been set up? No, no doubt. It can be done. It requires lots of conversations. But Bob Mueller is one of this country's great, great pros, and I'm sure you all will be able to work it out with him to run it in parallel. I want to thank you once again. I want to turn to the Vice Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, again, Director Comey, thank you for your service. And um, your comments to your FBI family, well, I know were heartfelt. Know that um, even though there are some in the administration who've tried to smear your reputation, you had Acting Director McCabe in public testimony a few weeks back and in public testimony yesterday reaffirm that the vast majority of the FBI community had great trust in your leadership and obviously uh, trust in your integrity. I want to go through a number of the meetings that you referenced in your testimony and let's start with the January 6th meeting in Trump Tower where you went up with a series of officials to brief the President-elect on the Russia investigation my understanding is you remained afterwards to brief him on, again, quote, some personally sensitive aspects of the information you relayed. Now, you said after that briefing, you felt compelled to document that conversation, that you actually started documenting it as soon as you got into the car. Now, you've had extensive experience at the Department of Justice and at the FBI. You've worked under presidents of both parties. What was it about that meeting that led you to determine that you needed to start putting down a written record? 
A combination of things. I think the circumstances, the subject matter, and the person I was interacting with. Circumstances first, I was alone with the President of the United States, or the President-elect, soon to be President. The subject matter, I was talking about matters that touch on the FBI's core responsibility and that relate to the President, President-elect personally. And then the nature of the person. I was honestly concerned that he might lie about the nature of our meeting, and so I thought it really important to document. That combination of things I'd never experienced before, but it led me to believe I got to write it down, and I got to write it down in a very detailed way. I think that's a very important statement you just made. And my understanding is that then, again, unlike your dealings with presidents of either parties in your past experience, in every subsequent meeting or conversation with this president, you created a written record. Did you feel that you needed to create this written record of these memos because they might need to be relied on at some future date? Sure. I created records after conversations, and I think I did it after each of our nine conversations. If I didn't, I did it for nearly all of them, especially the ones that were substantive. I knew that there might come a day when I would need a record of what had happened, not just to defend myself, but to defend the FBI and, and our integrity as an institution and the independence of our investigative function. That's what made this so, so difficult, is it was a combination of circumstances, subject matter, and the particular person. And so in all your experience, this was the only president that you felt like in every meeting you needed to document because at some point, using your words, he might put out a non-truthful representation of that meeting. Now, that's that's right, Senator. And I, I, as I said in my written testimony, as FBI director, I interacted with President Obama, and I spoke only twice in three years uh, and didn't document it. When I was Deputy Attorney General, I had one one-on-one -on -one meeting with President Bush about a very important and difficult national security matter. I didn't write a memo documenting that conversation either. Sent a quick email to my staff to let them know there was something going on. But I didn't feel with President Bush the need to document it in that way. Be again, because of the combination of those factors just wasn't present with either President Bush or President Obama. Yeah, I, I think that is very significant. I think others will probably question that. Now, our, the chairman and I have requested those memos. It is our hope that the FBI will get this committee access to those memos so that, again, we can read that contemporaneous rendition so that we've got your side of the story. Now, I know members have said and press have said um, that if you were a great deal has been made of whether the president you are asked to, in effect, indicate whether the president was the subject of any investigation. And my understanding is prior to your meeting on January 6th, you discussed with your leadership team whether or not you should be prepared to assure then-President-elect Trump that the FBI was not investigating him personally. Now, my understanding is your leadership team agreed with that, but was that a unanimous decision? Was there any debate about that? It wasn't unanimous. Um, one of the members of the leadership team had a view that although it was technically true, we did not have a counterintelligence file case open on then-President-elect Trump. His concern was because we're looking at the potential, again, that's the subject of the investigation, coordination between the campaign and Russia, because it was President Trump, President-elect Trump's campaign, this person's view was inevitably his behavior, his conduct will fall within the scope of that work, and so he was reluctant to make the statement that I made. I disagreed. I thought it was fair to say what was literally true. There is not a counterintelligence investigation of Mr. Trump, and I decided in the moment to say it, given the nature of our conversation. At that moment in time, did you ever revisit that as uh, in, in these subsequent sessions? With the FBI with leadership the team? team? Sure. Team. And, and uh, the, the leader who had that view, it didn't change. Uh, his view was still that it was probably, although literally true, his concern was it could be misleading because the nature of the investigation was such that it might well touch, obviously it would touch the campaign, and the person at the head of the campaign would be the candidate. And so that was his view throughout. Let me move to the January 27th dinner, where you said, quote, the president began by asking me whether I wanted to stay on as FBI director. He also indicated that Lots of people, again, your words, wanted the job. You go on to say that the dinner itself was seemingly an effort to, quote, 
to have you ask him for your job and create some sort of quote unquote patronage relationship. The president seems from my reading of your memo to be holding your job or your possibility of continuing in your job over your head in a fairly direct way. Uh, what was your impression and what did you mean by this notion of a patronage relationship? Well, it's my impression, and again, it's my impression, I could always be wrong, but my common sense told me that what was going on is either he had concluded or someone had told him that you didn't, you've already asked Comey to stay and you didn't get anything for it, and that the dinner was an effort to build a relationship, in fact, he asked specifically, of loyalty in the context of asking me to stay. And as I said, what was odd about that is we'd already talked twice about it by that point, and he'd said, uh, I very much hope you'll stay. I hope you'll stay. In fact, I just remembered sitting here a third one. When you've seen the picture of me walking across the blue room, uh, and uh, what the president whispered in my ear was, I really look forward to working with you. So after those encounters. And that was just a few days before you were fired. Yeah, that was on the, 20, the Sunday after the inauguration. The next Friday, I have dinner, and the president begins by wanting to talk about my job. And so I'm sitting there thinking, wait a minute, three times we've already You've already asked me to stay or talked about me staying. My common sense, again, I could be wrong, but my common sense told me what's going on here is that he's looking to get something in exchange for granting my request to stay in the job. And again, we all understand. Uh, I was a governor. I had people work for me. But this constant request, and again, quoting you, uh, him saying that he, uh, despite you explaining your in independence, he kept coming back to, I need loyalty. I expect loyalty. Uh, had you ever had any of those kind of requests before from anyone else you'd worked for in the government? No. And what made me uneasy was, I'm, at that point, the director of the FBI. The reason that Congress created a 10-year term is so that the director is not feeling as if they're serving at, with political loyalty owed to any particular person. The, the Statue of Justice has a blindfold on because you're not supposed to be peeking out to see whether your patron is pleased or not with what you're doing. It should be about the facts and the law. That's why I was, that's why I became FBI director, to, to be in that kind of position. So that's why I was so uneasy. Well, let me, let me move on. My time's running out. February 14th, again, it seems a bit strange. You were in a meeting, and your direct superior, the attorney general, was in that meeting as well. Yet the president asked everyone to leave, including the attorney general to leave, before he brought up the matter of General Flynn. Um, what was your impression of that type of action? Had you ever seen anything like that before? No. My impression was something big is about to happen. I need to remember every single word that is spoken. Uh, and again, I could be wrong. I'm 56 years old. I've been uh, <laughs> seen a few things. My sense was the attorney general knew uh, he shouldn't be leaving, which is why he was lingering. And I don't know Mr. Kushner well, but I think he picked up on the same thing. Uh, and so I knew something was about to happen that I needed to pay very close attention to. And I, I found it very interesting that in the memo that you wrote after this February 14th pull aside, you made clear that you wrote that memo in a way that was unclassified. Uh, if you affirmatively made the decision to write a memo that was unclassified, was that because you felt at some point the facts of that meeting would have to come clean and come clear and actually be able to be cleared in a way that could be shared with the American people? Well, I remember thinking this is a very disturbing development, really important to our work. I need to document it and preserve it in a way, and, and uh, this committee gets this, but sometimes when things are classified, it tangles them up. It's hard Amen. to share it within an investigative team. It's, you have to be very careful about how you handle it for good reason. So my thinking was, if I write it in such a way that I don't include anything that would trigger a classification, that'll make it easier for us to discuss within the FBI and the government and to, to hold on to it in a way that makes it accessible to us. Well, again, it's our hope, uh, particularly since you're a pretty knowledgeable guy and you wrote this in a way that was unclassified, that this committee will get access to that unclassified document. I think it would be very important to our investigation. Um, let me just ask this in closing. How many um, ongoing investigations at any time does the FBI have? Oh, ten, tens of thousands. Tens of thousands. Um, 
Did the President ever ask about any other investi ongoing investigation? No. Did he ever ask about you trying to interfere on any other investigation? No. Um, I think, again, this speaks volumes. This doesn't even get to the questions around the, the phone calls about lifting the cloud. Uh, I know other members will get to that, but uh, I really appreciate your testimony and appreciate your service to our nation. Thank you, Senator Warner. You know, I just, uh, I'm sitting here r going through my contacts with him. I had one conversation with the President that was classified where he asked about our, an ongoing um, intelligence investigation. It was brief and entirely professional. But he didn't ask you to take any specific oh, no. action on that, no. unlike what he had done vis-a-vis -vis Mr. Flynn and the overall Russia investigation. Correct. Thank you, sir. Senator Risch. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Comey, thank you for your service. Uh, America needs more like you, and we really appreciate it. Yesterday, uh, I got, and everybody got, the seven pages of your direct testimony that's now a part of the record here. And the first, I read it, then I read it again. And all I could think was, number one, how much I hated the class of legal writing when I was in law school. And you were the guy that probably got the A after, uh, after reading this. So uh, I, I find it clear. I find it concise. Uh, and uh, having been a prosecutor for a number of years and handling hundreds, maybe thousands of cases and read police reports, investigative reports, uh, this is as good as it gets, and uh, and I really appreciate that. Not only not only the conciseness and the clearness of it, but also the fact that you have uh, things that were written down contemporaneously when they happened, and you actually put them in quotes, so we know exactly what happened, and we're and we're not getting some uh, uh, rendition of it that uh, that's in your mind. So thank you. So sir. you're you're to be complimented. For I had that. great that, parents that's... and great teachers who beat that into me. That, that's so obvious, sir. Um, the, the chairman walked you through a number of things that the, the American people need to know and want to know. Number one, obviously we all know about the active measures that the Russians have taken. Uh, I think a lot of people were surprised at this. Those of us that work in the intelligence community, didn't, it didn't come as a surprise. But now the American people know this, and it's good they know this, because this is serious and it's a problem. I, I think secondly, um, I, I gather from all this that you're willing to say now that while you were director, the President of the United States w was not under investigation. Is that a fair statement? That's correct. All right. So that's a fact that we can rely on at this Yes, point. sir. Okay. On, uh, I remember uh, you, you talked with us shortly after February 14th when the New York Times wrote an article that suggested that the uh, Trump campaign was colluding with the Russians. You remember reading that article when it first came out? I do. It was about... Uh allegedly extensive electronic surveillance Correct. communications. Yes, and and uh, that upset you to the point where you actually went out and surveyed the intelligence community to see whether, whether you were missing something in that. Is that correct? That's correct. I want to be careful in open setting. I, I'm, but I, I'm not going to go any further than that. Okay. With it, so thank you. Um, in addition to that, after that, you sought out both Republican and Democrat senators uh, to tell them that, hey, I don't know where this is coming from. But this is not the case. The, the, this is not factual. Uh, do you recall that? Yes. Okay. So, so again, so the American people can understand this, that report by the New York Times was not true. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, in the main, it was not true. We, and again, all of you know this, but maybe the American people don't. Uh, the challenge, and I'm not picking on reporters, about writing stories about classified information is the people talking about it often don't really know what's going on, and those of us who actually know what's going on are not talking about it. And we don't call the press to say, hey, you got that thing wrong about this sensitive topic. We just have to leave it there. I mentioned to the chairman the nonsense around what influenced me to make the July 5th statement. Nonsense, but I can't go explaining how it's nonsense. Thank you. Uh, all right, so, so those three things we now know uh, regarding the active measures with the presence under investigation and the collusion between the uh, the Russian, uh, the Trump campaign and the Russians. I, I want to uh, drill right down as my time is limited uh, to the most recent dust up uh, regarding uh, allegations that the President of the United States uh, uh, obstructed justice. And boy, you nailed this down on page five, paragraph three. You put this in quotes, words matter. You wrote down the words so we can all have the words in front of us now. There's 28 words there that are in quotes and it says, quote, I hope this is the president speaking. I hope you can see your way clear to letting this go, to letting Flynn go. He is a good guy. I hope 
you can let this go. Now, those are his exact words, is that correct? Correct. And you wrote them here and you put them in quotes? Correct. Okay. Um, thank you for that. He did not direct you to let it go. Not in his words, no. He did not order you to let it go. Again, those words are not an order. No. He said, I hope. Now, like me, you probably did hundreds of cases, maybe thousands of cases, charging people with criminal offenses. And of course, you have knowledge of the thousands of cases out there that, uh, where people have been charged. Do you know of any case where a person has been charged for obstruction of justice, or for that matter, any other criminal offense where this, they said or thought they hoped for an outcome? I don't know well enough to answer. And the reason I keep saying his words is, I took it as a direction. Right. I mean, this is the President of the United States with me alone saying, I hope this. I took it as, this is what he wants me to do. Now, you, I, didn't, I didn't obey that, but that's the way I took it. You may have taken it as a direction, but that's not what he said. Correct. I, that's he, what I said, said. he said, I hope. Those are exact words. Okay. Correct. You, you don't know of anyone that's ever been charged for hoping something. Is that a fair statement? I don't as I sit here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Feinstein. Thanks very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Comey, I just want you to know that I have great respect for you. Um, Senator Cornyn and I sit on the Judiciary Committee, so we have occasion uh, to have you before us. And I know that you're a man of strength and integrity, and I really regret the situation that we all find ourselves in. Um, I just want to say that. Um, let me begin with one overarching question. Why do you believe you were fired? I guess I don't know for sure. I believe the pre I take the president at his word that I was fired because of the Russia investigation. Something about the way I was conducting it, the president felt created pressure on him that he wanted to relieve. Again, I didn't know that at the time, but I've watched his interview. I've read the press accounts of his conversations. So I take him at his word there. Now, look, I, I could be wrong. Maybe he's saying something that's not true, but I take him at his word, at least based on what I know now. Uh, talk for a moment about his request that you pledge loyalty and your response to that and what impact you believe that had. I, I don't know for sure because I don't know the president well enough to read him well. I think it was, first of all, our relationship didn't get off to a great start given the conversation yeah. I had to have on January 6th. This was not, uh, this didn't improve the relationship because it was very, very awkward. He was asking for something and I was refusing to give it. But again, I don't know him well enough to know how he reacted to that exactly. Do you believe the Russia investigation played a role? In why I was fired? Yes. Yes, because I've seen okay. the president say so. Um, let's let's uh, go to the Flynn issue. Um, uh, Senator Reich outlined uh, a, a I hope you could see your way to letting Flynn go. He's a good guy. I hope you can let this go. But you also said in your written remarks, and I quote, that you had understood the president to be requesting that we drop any investigation of Flynn in connection with false statements about his conversations with the Russian ambassador in December, end quote. Please go into that with more detail. Well, the the context and the president's words are what led me to that conclusion. As I said in my statement, I could be wrong, but Flynn had been forced to resign the day before. And, and the controversy around General Flynn at that point in time was centered on whether he had lied to the vice president about the nature of his conversations with the Russians, whether he had been uh, candid with others in the course of that. And so that happens on the day before. On the 14th, the president makes specific reference to that. And so that's why I understood him to be saying that what he wanted me to do was drop any investigation connected to Flynn's account of his conversations with the Russians. Now, here's the question. You're big, you're strong. I know the Oval Office, and I know uh, what happens to people when they walk in. There is a certain amount of intimidation. But why didn't you stop and say, Mr. President, this is wrong? I cannot discuss this with you. It's a great question. Maybe if I were stronger, I would have. 
I was so stunned by the conversation that I just took it in. And the only thing I could think to say, because I was playing in my mind, because I was going to remember every word he said, I was playing in my mind, what should my response be? And that's why I very carefully chose the words. And look, I, I've seen the tweet about tapes. Lordy, I hope there are tapes. I, I remember saying, I agree he's a good guy, as a way of saying, I'm not agreeing with what you just asked me to do. Again, maybe other people would be stronger in that circumstance, but that, that was, uh, that's how I conducted myself. I, I hope I'll never have another opportunity. Maybe if I did it again, I would do it better. Uh, you described two phone calls that you received from President Trump, one on March 30 and one on uh, April 11, where he, quote, described the Russia investigation as a cloud that was impairing his ability, end quote, as president, and asked you, quote, to lift the cloud, end quote. What, how did you interpret that? And what did you believe he wanted you to do? I interpreted that as he was frustrated that the Russia investigation was taking up so much time and energy, I, I think he meant of the executive branch, but in the, in the public square in general, and it was making it difficult for him to focus on other priorities of his. But what he asked me was actually narrower than that. So I think what he meant by the cloud, and again, I could be wrong, but what I think he meant by the cloud was the entire investigation is, is taking up oxygen and making it hard for me to focus on the things I want to focus on. The ask was to get it out that I, the president, am not personally under investigation. After um, April 11th, did he ask you more ever about the Russia investigation? Did he ask you any questions? We never spoke again after April 11th. You told the president, I, I would see what we could do. What did you mean? That was kind of a slightly cowardly way of trying to avoid telling him we're not going to do that, that I would see what we could do. It was a way of kind of uh, getting off the phone, frankly. And then I turned and handed it to the acting Deputy Attorney General, Mr. Bente. So I wanted to go into that. Who did you talk with about that? Uh, lifting the cloud, stopping the investigation back at the FBI, and what was their response? Well, the FBI, during one of the two conversations, I'm not remembering exactly, I think the first, my chief of staff was actually sitting in front of me and heard my end of the conversation because the president's call was a surprise. Uh, and I discussed the lifting the cloud and the request with the senior leadership team, who in, in a typically, and I think in all these circumstances, was the deputy director, my chief of staff, the general counsel, the deputy director's chief counsel, and I think um, in a number of circumstances, the number three in the FBI, and a few of the conversations included the head of the national security branch. So that group of us that lead the FBI when it comes to national security. Okay. You have the President of the United States asking you to stop an investigation that's an important investigation. What was the response of your colleagues? I think they were as shocked and troubled by it as I was. Um, some said things that led me to believe that. I don't remember exactly. But the reaction was similar to mine. They're all experienced people who had never experienced such a thing. So they were very concerned. And then the conversation turned to about, so what should we do with this information? And that was a struggle for us uh, because we are the leaders of the FBI, so it's been reported to us in that I heard it and now I've shared it with the leaders of the FBI. Our, our conversation was, should we share this with any senior officials at the Justice Department? Our, our absolute primary concern was we can't infect the investigative team. We don't want the agents and analysts working on this to know the President of the United States has, has asked, and when it comes to the President, I took it as a direction, to get rid of this investigation because we're not going to follow that, that request. And so we decided we got to keep it away from our troops, but is there anybody else we ought to tell at the Justice Department? And as I laid out in my, in my statement, we considered whether to tell the Attorney General, decided that didn't make sense because we believed, rightly, that he was shortly going to recuse. There were no other Senate-confirmed leaders in the Justice Department at that point. The Deputy Attorney General was Mr. Bente, who was acting and going to be shortly in that seat. 
And we decided the best move would be to hold it, keep it in a box, document it as we had already done, and then this investigation is going to go on, figure out what to do with it down the road. Is there a way to corroborate this? Our view at the time was, look, it's your word against the president's. There's no way to corroborate this. That, my view of that changed when the prospect of tapes was raised, but that's how we thought about it then. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Rubio. Thank you. Uh, Director Comey, uh, the meeting in the Oval Office where he made the request about uh, Mike Flynn, was that the only time he asked you to hopefully let it go? Yes. And in that meeting, uh, as you understood it, that was, he was asking not about the general Russia investigation. He was asking very specifically about the jeopardy that Flynn was in himself. That's how I understood it, yes, sir. And as you perceived it, while it was a request that you hoped you did away with it, you perceived it as an order, given his position, the setting, and the like, and the, some of the circumstances. Yes. Uh, at the time, did you say anything to the president about that is not an appropriate request, or did you tell the White House counsel that is not an appropriate request? Someone needs to go tell the president that he can't do these things? I didn't, no. Okay. Why? I don't know. I think, the, as I said earlier, I think the circumstances were such that it was, I was a bit stunned and didn't have the presence of mind. And I don't know, you know, I don't want to uh, uh, make you sound like I'm Captain Courageous. I don't know whether even if I had the presence of mind, I would have said to the president, sir, that's wrong. I don't know whether I would have. Okay. But in the moment, it, it, didn't, it didn't come to my mind. What came to my mind is be careful what you say. And so I said, I agree Flynn is a good guy. So on the cloud, we keep talking about this cloud, you perceive the cloud to be the Russian investigation in general. Yes, sir. Right? But his specific ask was that you would tell the American people what you had already told him, what you had already told the leaders of Congress, both Democrats and Republicans, that he was not personally under investigation. Yes, sir. That's In fact, he was asking you to do what you have done here today. Correct. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and again, at that setting, did you say to the president that it would be inappropriate for you to do so and then talk to the White House counsel or anybody so hopefully they would talk to him and tell him that he couldn't do this? First time I said, I'll see what we can do. Second time I explained how it should work, that the White House counsel should contact the Deputy Attorney General. You told and him the that. President said, okay, that, I think that's what I'll do. And, and just to be clear, for you to make a public statement that he was not under investigation would not have been illegal, but you felt it made no sense because it could potentially create a duty to correct if circumstances changed. Yes, sir. We wrestled with it before my testimony where I confirmed uh, that there was an investigation. And there were two primary concerns. One was, it creates a duty to correct, which I've lived before, and you want to be very careful about doing that. And second, it's a slippery slope, because if we say the president and the vice president aren't under investigation, what's the principled basis for, for stopping? Okay. And so I'll the leadership at, at Justice, acting Attorney General Bente, said you're not going to do that. Now, on March 30th, during the phone call about uh, General Flynn, you said he abruptly shifted and brought up something that you call, quote unquote, the McCabe thing. Specifically, the McCabe thing, as you understood it, was that McCabe's wife had received campaign money from what I assume means Terry McAuliffe. Yes, sir. That's what I It was what very I close to the Clintons. And, uh, and so why did you, had the president at any point in time expressed to you concern, opposition, potential opposition to McCabe? I don't like this guy because he got money from someone that's close to Clinton. He had asked me during previous conversations about Andy McCabe. Uh, and said, in essence, how's he going to be with me as president? I was pretty rough on him on the campaign trail. He was and rough on McCabe? He was rough, by his own account, he said he was rough on McCabe and Mrs. McCabe uh, on the campaign trail. How's he going to be? And I assured the president, Andy is a total pro. Um, the, no issue at all. You got to know the people of the FBI. They are not. So, uh, so then the president turns to you and says, remember, I never brought up the McCabe thing. Um, because you said he was a good guy. Did you perceive that to be a statement that um, I took care of you, I, I didn't do something because you told me he was a good guy, so now you know, I'm asking you potentially for something in return? Is that how you perceived it? I wasn't sure what to make of it, honestly. That's possible, but it, it, it was so out of context that I didn't have a clear view of what it was. Now, on a number of occasions here, you bring up, let's talk now about the general Russia investigation, okay? In page six of your testimony, you say, um, the first thing you say is, he asked what we could do to quote unquote lift the cloud, the general Russia investigation, and you responded that we were investigating the matter as quickly as we could and that there would be great benefit if we didn't find anything to having done the work well. And he agreed. He re-emphasized the problems it was causing him, but he agreed. So in essence, the president agreed with your statement that it would be great if we could have an investigation, all the facts came out, and 
we found nothing. So he agreed that that would be ideal, but this cloud is still <laughs> messing up my ability to do the rest of my agenda. Is that an accurate assessment? of? Yes, sir. He actually went farther than that. He, he said, and if some of my satellites did something wrong, it would be good to find that out. Well, that's the second part, and that is the satellites. He said if one of my satellites, I imagine by that he meant some of the other people surrounding his campaign did something wrong, it would be great to know that as well. Yes, sir. That's what he said. So are those the other, are those the on, only two instances in which that sort of back and forth happened where the president was basically saying, and I'm paraphrasing here, it's okay, do the Russia investigation. I hope it all comes out. I have nothing to do with anything Russia. Uh, it'd be great if it all came out, if people around me were doing things that were wrong. Yes, as I, I recorded it accurately there, that was the sentiment he was expressing. Yes, sir. So what it bears it comes down to is the president has asked three things of you. He asked for your loyalty, and you said you would be loyally honest. Honestly loyal. Honestly loyal. Um, the the he asked you on one occasion to let the Mike Flynn thing go because he was a good guy. By the way, you're aware that he said the exact same thing in the press the next day. He's a good guy. He's been treated unfairly, et cetera, et cetera. So I imagine your FBI agents read that. I'm sure they did. The, your, the president's wishes were known to them, certainly by the next day when he had a press conference with the prime minister. But going back, the three requests were, number one, be loyal. Number two, um, let the Mike Flynn thing go. He's a good guy. He's been treated unfairly. And number three, can you please tell the American people what these leaders in Congress already know, what you already know, what you've told me three times, that I'm not under pers personally under investigation? Those are the three things he asked. Yes, sir. You know, this investigation is full of leaks left and right. I mean, we've learned more from the newspapers sometimes than we do from our open hearings, for sure. Um, you ever wonder why, of all the things in this investigation, the only thing that's never been leaked is the fact that the president was not personally under investigation, despite the fact that both Democrats and Republicans and the leadership of Congress knew that and have known that for weeks? I don't know. I find matters that are briefed to the Gang of Eight uh, are pretty tightly held, in my experience. Finally, who are those senior leaders at the FBI that you shared these conversations with? As I said in response to Senator Feinstein's question, uh, Deputy Director, my Chief of Staff, General Counsel, the deputy director's chief counsel, and then more often than not, the number three person at the FBI who's the associate deputy director, and then quite often the head of the national security branch. Senator White. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Comey, welcome. You and I have had significant policy differences over the years, particularly protecting Americans' access to secure encryption. But I believe the timing of your firing stinks. And yesterday, you put on the record testimony that demonstrates why the odor of presidential abuse of power is so strong. Now to my questions. In talking to Senator Warner about this dinner that you had with the president, I believe January 27th, all in one dinner, the president raised your job prospects. He asked for your loyalty and denied allegations against him. All took place over one supper. Now, you told Senator Warner that the president was looking to, quote, get something. Looking back, did that dinner suggest that your job might be contingent on how you handled the investigation? I don't know that I'd go that far. I, I got the sense my j job would be contingent upon how he felt I, <clears throat> excuse me, how he felt I conducted myself and whether I demonstrated loyalty. But I don't know whether I'd go so far as to connect it to you the investigation. You said the president was trying to create some sort of patronage relationship. In a patronage relationship, isn't the underling expected to behave in a manner consistent with the wishes of the boss? Yes. Okay. Or at least consider how what you're doing will affect the boss as a significant consideration. Let me turn to the Attorney General. In your statement, you said that you and the FBI leadership team decided not to discuss the President's actions with Attorney General Sessions, even though he had not recused himself. What was it about the Attorney General's own interactions with the Russians or his behavior with regard to the investigation that would have led the entire leadership of the FBI to make this decision? 
Our judgment, as I recall, was that he was very close to and inevitably going to recuse himself for a variety of reasons. We also were aware of facts that I can't discuss in an open setting that would make his continued engagement in a Russia-related investigation problematic. And so we were, we were convinced, and in fact, I think we'd already heard that the career people were recommending that he recuse himself, that he was not going to be in contact with Russia-related matters much longer. And that turned out to be the case. How would you characterize Attorney General Sessions' adherence to his recusal, in particular with regard to his involvement in your firing, which the President has acknowledged was because of the Russian investigation? That's a question I can't answer. I think it's a reasonable question. If, if as the President said, I was fired because of the Russian investigation, why was the Attorney General involved in that chain? I don't know. And so, um, I don't have an answer for the question. Your testimony was that the President's request about Flynn could infect the investigation. Had the President got what he wanted and what he asked of you, what would have been the effect on the investigation? Well, we would have closed any investigation of General Flynn in connection with uh, his statements and encounter, statements about and encounters with Russians in the late part of December. So, so we, would have, we would have dropped an open criminal investigation. So in effect, when you talk about infecting the enterprise, you would have dropped something major that would have spoken to the overall ability of the American people to get the facts. Correct. And, and as good as our people are, our judgment was we don't want them hearing that the President of the United States wants this to go away because it might have an effect on their ability to be fair and impartial and aggressive. Now, the acting Attorney General Yates found out that Michael Flynn could be blackmailed by the Russians, and she went immediately to warn the White House. Flynn is gone, but other individuals with contacts with the Russians are still in extremely important positions of power. Should the American people have the same sense of urgency now with respect to them? I think all I can say, Senator, is it's a the, the special counsel's investigation is very important, understanding what efforts there were or are by the Russian government to influence our government is a critical part of the FBI's mission. So, and you've got the right person in Bob Mueller to lead it. So it's a very important piece of work. Vice President Pence was the head of the transition. To your knowledge, was he aware of the concerns about Michael Flynn prior to or during General Flynn's tenure as National Security Advisor? I don't, you're asking, including up to the time when Flynn was uh, forced to resign. My understanding is that he was, and I'm trying to remember where I get that understanding from. I think from uh, Acting Attorney General Yates. So former Acting Attorney General Yates testified that concerns about General Flynn were discussed with the intelligence community. Would that have included anyone at the CIA or uh, Dan Coates's office, the DNI? I would assume yes. Michael Flynn resigned four days after Attorney General Sessions was sworn in. Do you know if the Attorney General was aware of the concerns about Michael Flynn during that period? I don't, as I sit here. I don't, I don't recall that he was. I, I, I could be wrong, but I don't remember that he was. And. Finally, let's see if you can give us some sense of who recommended your firing. Besides the letters from the Attorney General, the Deputy Attorney General, do you have any information on who may have recommended or have been involved in your firing? I don't. I don't. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Senator Collins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Comey, let me begin by thanking you for your voluntary compliance with our request to appear 
before this committee and assist us in this very important investigation. I want first to ask you about your conversations with the president, the three conversations in which you told him that he was not under investigation. The first was during your January 6th meeting, according to your testimony, in which it appears that you actually volunteered that assurance. Is that correct? That's correct. Did you limit that statement to counterintelligence investigations, or were you talking about any kind of FBI investigation? I didn't, I didn't use the term counterintelligence. I was speaking to him and briefing him about some salacious and unverified material. It was in the context of that that he had a strong and defensive reaction about that not being true. And my reading of it was it was important for me to assure him we were not personally investigating him. And so the context then was actually narrower, focused on what I just talked to him about. But it was very important because it was first true. And second, I was worried very much about being in kind of a kind of a J. Edgar Hoover type situation. I didn't want him thinking that I was briefing him on this to sort of hang it over him in some way. I was briefing him on it because we had been told by the media it was about to launch. We don't want to be keeping that from him. And if there was some, he needed to know this was being said. But I was very keen not to leave him with an impression that the Bureau was trying to do something to him. And so that's the context in which I said, sir, we're not personally investigating you. And then on, and that's why you volunteered the information. Yes, ma'am. Correct. Then on the January 27th dinner, you, show, you told the president that he should be careful about asking you to investigate because, quote, you might create a narrative that we are investigating him personally, which we weren't. Again, were you limiting that statement to counterintelligence investigations or more broadly, such as a criminal investigation? The context was very similar. I didn't, I didn't modify the word investigation. It was, again, he was reacting strongly, again, to that unverified material saying, I'm tempted to order you to investigate it. And that, in the context of that, I said, sir, you want to be careful about that because it might create a narrative we're investigating you personally. And then there was the March 30th phone call with the president in which you reminded him that congressional leaders have been briefed that we were not personally, the FBI was not personally investigating President Trump. And again, was that statement to congressional leaders and to the president limited to counterintelligence investigations, or was it a broader statement? I'm think, trying to understand yeah. whether there was any kind of investigation of the president uh, underway. No, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, and if I misunderstood, I apologize. We briefed the congressional leadership about what Americans we had opened counterintelligence investigation cases on, and we specifically said the president is not one of those Americans, but that there was no other investigation of the president that we were not mentioning at that time. What the context was counterintelligence, but I wasn't trying to hide some criminal investigation of the president. And was the president under investigation at the time of your dismissal on May 9th? No. I'd like to now turn to the conversations with the president about Michael Flynn, which have been discussed at great length. And first, let me make very clear that the president never should have cleared the room, and he never should have asked you as you reported, to let it go, to let the investigation go. But I remained puzzled by your response. Your response was, I agree that Michael Flynn is a good guy. You could have said, Mr. President, this meeting is inappropriate. This response could compromise the investigation. You should not be making such a request. It's fundamental to the operation of our government that the FBI be insulated from this kind of political pressure. And you've talked a bit today about that you were stunned by the president making the request. But my question to you is later on 
upon reflection, did you go to anyone at the Department of Justice and ask them to call the White House Counsel's Office and explain that the President had to have a far better understanding and appreciation of his role vis-a-vis -vis the FBI? In general, I did. I spoke to the Attorney General and I spoke to the new Deputy Attorney General, Mr. Rosenstein, when he took office and explain my serious concern about the way in which the president is interacting, especially with the FBI. And I specifically, as I said in my testimony, I asked the, told the Attorney General, it can't happen that you get kicked out of the room and the president talks to me. But look, in the room, and, and, but why didn't we raise the specific? It was of investigative interest to us to try and figure out, so what just happened uh, with the president's request? So I would not have wanted to alert the White House that it had happened until we figured out what are we going to do with this investigatively. Your testimony was that you went to Attorney General Sessions and said, don't ever leave me alone with him again. Are you saying that you also told him that he had made a request that you let it go with regard to part of the investigation of Michael Flynn? No, I specifically did not. I did not. You mentioned that from your very first meeting with the president, you decided to write a memo memorializing the conversation. What was it about that very first meeting that made you write a memo when you had not done that with two previous presidents? As I said, a, a combination of things. Uh, a gut feeling is an important overlay on the, but the circumstances that I was alone, the subject matter, and the nature of the person that I was interacting with, and my read of that person. And, yeah, and, and, and really just a gut feel laying on top of all of that, that this, it's gonna be important to protect this organization that I make records of this. And finally, did you show copies of your memos to anyone outside of the Department of Justice? Yes. And to whom did you show copies? I asked, the um, president tweeted on Friday after I got fired that I better hope there's not tapes. I woke up in the middle of the night on Monday night, because it didn't dawn on me originally, that there might be corroboration for our conversation. There might be a tape. And my judgment was I needed to get that out into the public square. And so I asked a friend of mine to share the content of the memo with a reporter. Didn't do it myself for a variety of reasons, but I asked him to because I thought that might prompt the appointment of a special counsel. And so I asked a close friend of mine to do it. And was that Mr. Wittes? No, uh -uh, no. Who was that? A good friend of mine who's a professor at Columbia Law School. Thank you. Senator Heinrich. Mr. Comey, uh, prior to January 27th of this year, have you ever had um, a one-on-one -on -one meeting or, or a private dinner with a president of the United States? No. I met dinner, no. I had two one-on-ones with President Obama that I laid out in my testimony, once to talk about law enforcement issues, law enforcement and race, which was an important topic throughout for me and for the president, and then once very briefly for him to say goodbye. Were those brief interactions? No. The one about law enforcement and race and policing, we spoke for probably over an hour, just okay. the two of us. How unusual is it to have um, a one-on-one -on -one dinner with the president? Did that strike you as odd? Yeah, so much so that I assumed there would be others, that he couldn't possibly be having dinner with me alone. Um, if, do you have an impression that if you had found, uh, if you had behaved differently in that dinner, and uh, I am quite pleased that you did not, but if you had found a way to express some sort of uh, expression of loyalty or given some uh, suggestion that the Flynn criminal investigation might um, be pursued less vigorously, do you think you would have still been fired? I don't know. I, it, it's impossible to say looking back. I don't know. But you felt like those two things were, were directly relevant to your um, the kind of relationship that the president was seeking to establish with you? Sure, yes. Yeah. Um, 
The, the President has repeatedly talked about the Russian investigation into the U.S. Uh, or the Russian, Russia's involvement in the U.S. election cycle as a hoax and as fake news. Can you talk a little bit about what you saw as FBI director, and obviously only the parts that you can share in this setting, uh, that, uh, that demonstrate how serious this action actually was and why there was an investigation in the first place? Yes, sir. The, there should be no fuzz on this whatsoever. The Russians interfered in our election during the 2016 cycle. They did it with purpose. They did it with sophistication. They did it with overwhelming technical efforts. And it was an active measures campaign driven from the top of that government. There is no fuzz on that. It is a high confidence judgment of the entire intelligence community. And, and the members of this committee have uh, seen the intelligence. It's not a close call. That happened. That's about as unfake as you can possibly get and is very, very serious, which is why it's so refreshing to see a bipartisan focus on that, because this is about America, not about any particular party. So that was a hostile act by the Russian government against this country? Yes, sir. Did the President, in any of those interactions that you've um, shared with us today, ask you what you should be doing, or what our government should be doing, or the intelligence community, to protect America against Russian interference in our election system. I don't recall a conversation like that. Never. No. Do you, do you find not with, it not odd? With, not with President Trump. Right. I attended a fair number of meetings on that with the President Obama. Do you find it odd that the President seemed unconcerned by Russia's actions in our election? I, I can't answer that because I don't know what other conversations he had with other advisors or other intelligence community leaders. So I, I, I just don't know sitting here. Did you have any interactions with the President that suggested he was taking that hostile action seriously? I don't remember any interactions with the President uh, other than the initial briefing on January the 6th. I don't remember, could be wrong, but I don't remember any conversations with him at all about that. As you're very aware, um, it was only the two of you in the room for that dinner. Uh, you've told us that the president asked you to back off the Flynn investigation. The president told a reporter. Not in that dinner. Oh, sure. Fair enough. Told the reporter he did, never did that. Uh, you've testified that the president asked for your loyalty in that dinner. The White House denies that. Um, a lot of this comes down to who should we believe? Do you want to say anything as to why we should believe you? Probably. My mother raised me not to say things like this about myself, so I'm not going to. Um, I think people should look at the whole body of my testimony. Mm -hmm. Because as I used to say to juries that when I talked about a witness, you can't cherry pick it. You can't say, I like these things he said, but on this, he's a, he's a dirty, rotten liar. Right. You got to take it all together. And I've tried to be open and fair and transparent and accurate. A really significant fact to me is, so why did he kick everybody out of the Oval Office? Why would you kick the Attorney General, the President, the Chief of Staff out to talk to me if it was about something else? And so that, that to me, is a, as an investigator, is a very significant fact. And as we look at, at testimony or as communication from both of you, we should probably be looking for consistency. Well, in looking at any witness, you look at consistency, track record, demeanor, uh, record over time, that sort of thing. Thank you. So there are reports that the incoming Trump administration, either during the transition and or after the inauguration, attempted to set up a, a sort of backdoor communication channel with the Russian government using their infrastructure, their devices or facilities. What would be the risks? Uh, particularly for a transition, someone not actually in the office of the president yet, to setting up unauthorized channels with a hostile foreign government, especially if they were to evade our own American intelligence services. I'm not going to comment on whether that happened in an open setting, but the risk is, primary risk is obvious. You spare the Russians the cost and effort of having to break into our communications channels by using theirs. And so you make it a whole lot easier for them to capture all of your conversations uh, and then to use those to the benefit of Russia against the United States. 
the memos that you wrote, um, you wrote, did you write all nine of them in a way that uh, was designed to prevent them from needing classification? No. A and on a few of the occasions I wrote, I sent emails to mm -hmm. my chief of staff or others on some of the brief phone conversations that I recall. Uh, the first one, was a classified briefing. Although it wasn't in a skiff, it was in a conference room at Trump Tower. Mm -hmm. It was a classified briefing, and so I wrote that on a classified device. The one I started typing gotcha. in the car, that was a classified laptop that I started working on. Any reason in a classified environment, in a skiff, that this committee would, it would not be appropriate to see those communications from, at least from your perspective as the author? No. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Blunt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Comey, when you were terminated at the FBI, I said, and still continue to feel that you have provided years of great service to the country, I also said that I'd had significant questions over the last year about some of the decisions you made. If, if the President hadn't terminated your service, would you still be, in your opinion, the director of the FBI today? Yes, sir. So you took as a direction from the president something that you thought was serious and troublesome, but continued to show up for work the next day? Yes, sir. And six weeks later, we're still telling the, we're telling the president on March the 30th that he was not personally the target of any investigation. Correct. On March the 30th, and I think again on, I think on April 11th as well, I told him we're not investigating him personally. That was true. Well, the point to me, the concern to me there is that all these things are going on. You now, in retrospect, or at least you now, to this committee, that these were, you had serious concerns about what the president had, you believe, directed you to do uh, and had taken no action, hadn't even reported up the chain of command, assuming you believe there is an up the chain of command. Uh, that these things had happened. Do you have a sense of that looking back, that that was a mistake? No. In fact, I think no action was the most important thing I could do to make sure there was no interference with the investigation. And on the, on the Flynn issue specifically, I believe you said earlier uh, that you believe the President was suggesting you drop any investigation of Flynn's account of his conversation with the Russian ambassador, which was essentially misleading the vice president and others? Correct. And, and I'm not going to go into the details, but whether there were false statements made to government investigators as well. The, um, any suggestion that, the, 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 that uh, General Flynn had violated the Logan Act, I always find pretty incredible. The Logan Act's been on the books for over 200 years. Nobody's ever been prosecuted uh, for violating the Logan Act. My sense would be that the, the discussion not the problem misleading investigators or the vice president might have been. That's fair. Yes, sir. And in your, had you previously on February the 14th discussed with the president in the previous meeting anything your investigators had learned or their impressions from talking to Flynn? No, sir. So he said he's a good guy. You said he's a good guy. And that was no further action taken on that. Well, he said more than that, but there was no, the action was, I wrote it up, briefed our senior team, tried to figure out what to do with it, and just made a decision. We're going to hold this and then see what we make of it down the road. Yes, sir. Was it your view that not briefing up meant you really had no responsibility to report that to the Justice Department in some way? I think at some point, and, and I don't know what Director Mueller is going to do with it, but at some point, I was sure we were going to brief it to the team in charge of the case. But our judgment was, in the short term, it doesn't make sense to – no fuzz on the fact that I reported to the Attorney General. That's why I stressed he shouldn't be kicked out of the room. But it didn't make sense to report to him now. You know, you said the Attorney General said, I don't want to be in the room with him alone again, but you continue to talk to him on the phone. What is yeah. the difference in being in the room alone with him and talking to him on the phone alone? Yeah, I think what I stressed the Attorney General is a little broader than just the room. I said, you – I report to you, it's very important you be between me and the White House. Between a after that discussion with the Attorney General, did you take phone calls from the President? Yes, sir. So I'm why did you just say you need to talk to, why didn't you say I'm not taking that call, you need to talk to the Attorney General? 
Well, I, I did on the April 11th call, and I reported the calls, the March 30th call and the April 11th call, to my superior, who was the acting deputy attorney general. I, I don't want to run out of time here. Let me make one other point. In reading your testimony, January the 3rd, January the 27th, and March the 30th, it appears to me that on all three of those occasions, you, unsolicited by the president, made the point to him that he was not a target of, the, of an investigation. Correct. Yes, sir. One, I thought the March 30th, very interesting. You said, well, even though you don't want, you may not want us, that was the 27th, where he said, why don't you look into that dossier thing more? You said, well, you may not want that because then we couldn't tell you, you couldn't say with, uh, we couldn't answer the question about you being a target of the investigation, but you didn't seem to be in answering that question anyhow. As Senator Rubio pointed out, the one unanswered, unleaked question seems to have been that uh, in this whole period of time. But you said something earlier I don't want to fail to follow up on. You said after you were dismissed, you gave information to a friend mm -hmm. so that friend could get that information into the public media. Correct. What kind of information was that? Was not, what kind of information did you give to a friend? That the, pre the, the, uh, the Flynn conversation, that the president had asked me to let the, the Flynn, I mean, I'm forgetting my exact own words, but the, the conversation in the Oval Office. So you didn't consider your memo or your sense of that conversation to be a government document you consider it to be somehow your own personal document that you could share with the media as you wanted to correct through I, a friend i understood this to be my recollection recorded of my conversation with the president as a private citizen i felt free to share that i thought it very important to get it out so were all of your memos that you recorded on classified or other documents uh, memos that might be yours as a private citizen I'm sorry, I'm not following the question. Well, I think you said you'd use classified, a classified. Uh, oh, yeah, not the equipment. classified documents. Unclassified. I don't have any of them anymore, but I gave them to the special counsel. But, yeah, my view was that the content of those unclassified, the memorialization of those conversations was my recollection recorded. So why didn't you give those to somebody yourself rather than give them through a third party? Because I was worried the media was camping at the end of my driveway at that point, and I was actually going out of town with my wife to hide, and I worried it would be like feeding seagulls at the beach if, if, it, was, if it was I who gave it to the media. So I asked my friend, make sure this gets out. It does seem to me that what you do there is create a source close to the former director of the FBI as opposed to just taking responsibility yourself for saying, here are these records. Um, and uh, like everybody else, I have other things I'd like to get into, but uh, I'm out of time. Okay. Senator King. Thank you. First, I'd like to acknowledge Senator Blumenthal and earlier Senator Nelson. I think the one principal thing you'll learn today, Senator, is that the chairs there are less comfortable than the chairs here. Uh, but I welcome you to the hearing. Uh, Mr. Comey, a broad question. Uh, was the Russian activity in the 2016 election a one-off proposition, or is this part of a long-term strategy? Will they be back? Oh, it's a long-term practice of theirs. It, it stepped up a notch in a significant way in 16. They'll be back. I, I think that's very important for the American people to understand, that this is, this is very much a forward-looking investigation in terms of how do we understand what they did and how do we prevent it. Would you agree that that's a big part of our role here? Yes, sir. And it's not a Republican thing or a Democratic thing. It really is an American thing. They're going to come for whatever party uh, they choose to try and uh, work on behalf of. And they're, they're not devoted to either, in my experience. They're just about their own advantage. And they will be back. That's my observation. I don't think Putin is a Republican or a Democrat. He's an opportunist. I think that's a fair statement. Uh, with regard to the uh, several of these conversations, in his interview with Lester Holt on NBC, the president said, I had dinner with him. He wanted to have dinner because he wanted to stay on. Is this an accurate statement? No, sir. Did you in any way initiate that dinner? No. He, call, he called me at my desk at lunchtime and asked me, uh, was I free for dinner that night? I called himself and said, uh, can you come over for dinner tonight? And I said, yes, sir. He said, will six work? I think he said six first. And then he said, I was going to invite your whole family, but we'll do that next time. I wanted you to come over. And is, is that a good time? I said, sir, whatever works for you. And then he said, uh, how about 630? 
And I, I said, whatever works for you, sir. And then I hung up and had to call my wife and break a date with her. I was supposed to take her out to dinner that night. Uh, and That's uh, one of the all-time great excuses for breaking a date. Yeah. <laughs> In retrospect, I would have, I love spending time with my wife. I wish I'd been there that night. That's one question I'm not going to follow up, Mr. Cohen. But in that same interview, the president said, in one case, I called him, and in one case, he called me. Is that an accurate statement? No. Did you ever call the president? No. I, I might. The only reason I'm hesitating is I think there was at least one conversation where I was asked to call the White House switchboard to be connected to him. But I, I never initiated a communication with the president. Uh, and in his press conference on May 18th, the president was asked whether he had urged you to shut down the investigation into Michael Flynn. The president responded, quote, no, no. Next question. Is that an accurate statement? I don't believe it is. Thank you. Um, with regard to the question of him being under personal, personally under investigation, uh, does that mean that the dossier is not being reviewed or investigated or followed up on in any way? I obviously can't come, I can't come in either way. I can't talk in an open setting about the investigation as it was when I was the head of the FBI. And obviously it's, it's Director Mueller's, Bob Mueller's responsibility now, so I just, I don't know. So clearly your statements to the president back in those, these various times when you assured him he wasn't under investigation were as of that moment. Is that, that correct, is it correct. not? Correct. Uh, now, on the Flynn investigation, is it not true that Mr. Flynn was and is a central figure in this entire investigation of the relationship between the Trump campaign and the Russians? I can't answer that in an open setting, sir. Uh, and uh, certainly Mr. Flynn was part of the so-called Russian investigation. Can you answer that question? I have to give you the same answer. All right. Uh, we'll be having a closed session shortly, so we will follow up on that. In terms of his comments to you about, uh, I think you were in response to Mr. Risch, Senator Risch, you said, he said, I hope you will hold back on that. But when you get a, when a president in the United States in the Oval Office says something like, I hope, or I suggest, or, or would you, do you take that as a, as a, as a directive? Yes. Yes. It rings in my ear as kind of, will no one rid me of this meddlesome priest? It, I was just going to quote that in 1170, December 29, Henry II said, who will rid me of this meddlesome priest? And then the next day he was killed. Thomas a. Beckett, that's exactly the same situation. You're, we're thinking al along the same lines. Uh, several other uh, uh, questions, and these are a little bit more detailed. What do you know about the Russian bank VEB? Nothing that I can talk about in an open setting. Well, I, mean, that I know takes it exists. I know it exists. <laughs> yes, sir. You know it exists. Uh, what is the relationship of ambassador, uh, uh, the ambassador from Russia to the United States to the Russian intelligence uh, infrastructure? Well, he's a diplomat who is the chief of mission at the Russian embassy, which employs a robust uh, cohort of intelligence officers. And so surely he's witting of their very, very aggressive intelligence operations, at least some of it in the United States. I don't, I don't consider him to be an intelligence officer himself. He's a diplomat. Did you ever, did the FBI ever brief the Trump administration about the, the uh, advisability of interacting uh, directly with Ambassador Kislyak? I think all I can say sitting here is there were a variety of defensive briefings given to the incoming administration about the counterintelligence risk. Back to Mr. Flynn, would the, would, Closing out the Flynn investigation have impeded the overall Russian investigation? No. It, well, unlikely, except to the extent there's always a possibility if you have a criminal case against someone and you bring it and squeeze them, you flip them, and they give you information about something else. But I saw the two as uh, touching each other but separate. Uh, with regard to your memos, isn't it true that in a, in a court case when you're weighing evidence, contemporaneous memos and contemporary, contemporaneous statements to third parties are considered probative in terms of the, the, uh, the uh, validity of, of testimony? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Senator Cotton. Oh, excuse me, Senator Langford. 
Well, Director Comey, good to see you again. <laughs> you too. We've had multiple opportunities to be able to visit, as everyone on this dais has. And uh, I appreciate you and your service and what you have done uh, for the nation for a long time, which you continue to do. I told you before in the heat of last year when we had the opportunity to visit personally that I pray for you and for your family because you do carry a tremendous amount of stress. And uh, that is still true today. Thank you. Let me, uh, let me walk through a couple of things with you. Uh, your notes are obviously exceptionally important uh, because they give a very rapid account uh, of what you, what you wrote down and what you perceived happened in those different meetings. Uh, have you had the opportunity to be able to reference those notes when you were preparing the written statement that you put for us today? Yes. I, uh, yes. I think nearly all of my written uh, recordings of my conversations, I had a chance to review them before uh, filing my statement. Do you have a copy of any of those notes personally? I don't. I turned them over to Bob Mueller's uh, investigators. The individual that you uh, told about your memos? Uh, that then was sent on to the New York Times. Did they have a copy of those memos, or were they told orally of those memos? Had a copy. I had a copy at the time. Do they? Do they still have a copy of those memos? It's a good question. I think so. I guess I can't say for sure sitting here, but I, 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 I guess I don't know, but I think so. So the question is, could you ask them to hand that copy right back to you so you could hand them over to this committee? Potentially. I would like to move that from potential to see if we can ask that question uh, so we can have a copy of those. Obviously, those notes are exceptionally important to us uh, to be able to go through the process so we can we can continue to get to the facts as, as we see it. As you know, the written documents are exceptionally important. Yeah. Are there other documents that we need to be aware of that you used in your preparation for your written statement that we should also have that would assist us in helping with this? Not that I'm aware of, no. Um, Past the February the 14th meeting, uh, which is a very important meeting, obviously, as we discuss the conversations here about Michael Flynn. When the president asked you uh, about, he hopes that you would let this go, and the, the conversation back and forth about him being a good guy, after that time, did the president ever bring up anything about Michael Flynn again to you? You had multiple other conversations you have documented with the president. No, I don't remember him ever bringing it up again. Did any member of the White House staff ever come to you and talk to you about letting go of the Michael Flynn case or dropping it or anything referring to that? No, no. Nope. Did the Director of National Intelligence come to you and talk to you about that? No. Did anyone from the Attorney General's Office, the Department of Justice, ask you about that? No. Uh, did the head of NSA talk to you about that? No. The, the key aspect here is if, if this seems to be something the president's trying to get you to drop it, this seems like a pretty light touch to drop it, to bring it up at that moment, the day after he had just fired Flynn, to come back in and say, I hope we can let this go, but then it never reappears again. Did, did it slow down your investigation or any investigation that may or may not be occurring with Michael Flynn? No, although I don't know there are any manifestations, outward manifestations of the investigation between February 14th and when I was fired. So I, I don't know that the president would have any way of knowing whether it was effective or not. Okay, that's fair enough. If, uh, if the president wanted to stop an investigation, how would he do that? Uh, knowing it's an ongoing criminal investigation or counterintelligence investigation, would that be a matter of trying to go to you, you perceive, and to say you make it stop because he doesn't have the authority to stop? Or how, how would the president make an ongoing investigation stop? Again, I'm not a legal scholar, so smarter people answer this better. But I think as a legal matter, the president is the head of the executive branch and could direct, in theory, we have important norms against this, but direct that anybody be investigated or anybody not be investigated. I think he has the legal authority because all of us ultimately report in the executive branch up to the president. Okay. Would that be to you? Would that be to the attorney general? Would that be to who that would do that? Suppose he could do it to, if he wanted to issue a direct order, could do it in any way. Could do it through the attorney general or issue it directly to me. Well, is there any question that the president is not real fond of this investigation? I can think of multiple 140-word character expressions that he's done publicly to express he's not fond of the investigations. I've heard you share before in this conversation that you're trying to keep the agents that are working on it away from any comment the president might have made. Quite frankly, the president has informed around 6 billion people that he's not real fond of this investigation. Do you think there's a difference in that? Yes. Okay. What I think there's be? a big difference in kicking superior officers out of the Oval Office, looking the FBI director in the eye and saying, I hope you'll let this go. I think if our, 
if the agents, as good as they are, heard the President of the United States did that, That's you. there's a real risk of a chilling effect on their work. That's okay. why we kept it so tight. Okay. Um, you had mentioned before about some news stories and news accounts. Without having to go into all the names in the specific times and to be able to dip into all that, have there been news accounts about the Russia investigation, about collusion, uh, about this whole event uh, or accusations that as you read the story, you were stunned about how wrong they got the facts? Yes, there have been many, many stories purportedly based on classified information about, well, about lots of stuff, but especially about Russia that are just dead wrong. I was interested in your comment that you made as well, that the President said to you, if there were some satellite associates of his that did something wrong, it would be good to find that out. That the President seemed to talk to you specifically on March the 30th and say, I'm frustrated that the word is not getting out that I'm not under investigation, but if there are people that are in my circle that are, let's finish the investigation. Is that how you took it as yes, well? Yes, sir. Yes. And then you made a comment earlier about um, the Attorney General, uh, previous Attorney General, uh, asking you about the uh, investigation on the Clinton emails, saying that you've been asked not to call it an investigation anymore, but to call it a matter. And you had said that confused you. Can you give us additional details on that? Well, it concerned me because we were at the point where we had refused to confirm the existence, as we typically do, of an investigation for months. And it was getting to a place where that looked silly because the campaigns were talking about interacting with the FBI in the course of our work. The, the Clinton campaign at the time was using all kinds of euphemisms, security review, matters, things like that for what was going on. We were getting to a place where the Attorney General and I were both going to have to testify and talk publicly about it. And I want to know, was she going to authorize us to confirm we had an investigation? And she said, yes, but don't call it that. Call it a matter. And I said, why would I do that? And she said, just call it a matter. And again, you look back in hindsight, you think, should I have resisted harder? I just said, all right, isn't worth, this isn't a hill worth dying on. And so I just said, okay, the press is going to completely ignore it. And that's what happened when I said, we have opened a matter. They all reported the FBI has an investigation open. Uh, and so that concerned me because that language tracked the way the campaign was talking about the FBI's work. And that, that's concerning. It gave the impression that the campaign was somehow using the same language as the FBI because you were handed the campaign language and told yeah. to be able to use the campaign. Whether, and again, I don't know whether it was intentional or not, but it gave the impression that the Attorney General was looking to align the way we talked about our work with the way a political campaign was describing the same activity, which was inaccurate. We had a criminal investigation open, with, as I said before, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. We had an investigation open at the time, and so that gave me a queasy feeling. Thank you. Senator Manchin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Comey. I appreciate very much you being here. Um, West Virginians are very interested in this, uh, in, in this uh, hearing that we're having today. I've had over 600 requests for questions to ask you <laughs> from my fellow West Virginians, and most of them have been asked. And there's quite a few of them that were quite detailed while asking our uh, classified hearing. I want to thank you, first of all, for coming and agreeing to be here, volunteering, but also volunteering to stay into the classified hearing. I don't know if you had a chance to watch our hearing yesterday. I uh, watched part of it, yes, watch. sir. And it was quite troubling. Um, my colleagues here had some very pointed questions they wanted answers to. They weren't classified. They could have answered in this open setting. They refused to do so. So that even much makes us much more appreciative of your cooperation. Um, sir, the seriousness of the Russian aggressions in, in our past elections and knowing that it will be ongoing, as Senator King had alluded to, uh, does what, what's your concerns there? I mean, what, what should the American public understand? People said, well, this is a, why are we worried about this? Why make such a big deal out of this Russian investigation? Can you tell me what your thoughts yes, would be? Sir. And then the final thing is on this same topic. Did the president ever show any concern or interest or curiosity about what the Russians were doing? Uh, thank you, Senator. As I said earlier, I don't remember any conversations with the president about the Russia uh, election interference. Did he ever ask you any questions concerning this? Well, there was an initial briefing of our findings, and I think there was conversation there. I don't remember it exactly, uh, where he asked questions about what we had found and what our sources were and what our confidence level was. But after that, I don't remember anything. What, what the reason this is such a big deal is we have this big, messy, wonderful country where we fight with each other all the time, but nobody tells us 
what to think, what to fight about, what to vote for, except other Americans. And that's wonderful and often painful. But we're talking about a foreign government that using technical intrusion and lots of other methods tried to shape the way we think, we vote, we act. That is a big deal. And people need to recognize it. It's not about Republicans or Democrats. They're coming after America, which I hope we all love equally. They want to undermine our credibility in the face of the world. They think that this great experiment of ours is a threat to them. And so they're going to try to run it down and dirty it up as much as possible. That's what this is about. And they will be back because we remain, as, as difficult as we can be with each other, we remain that shining city on the hill. And they don't like it. So this and is extremely important. It's yeah. extremely dangerous what we're, what we're dealing with. And it's needed, is what you're saying. Yes, sir. Um, do you believe there were any tapes uh, or recordings of your conversations with the president? It never occurred to me till the president's tweet. I'm, I'm not being facetious. I hope there are, and I'll consent to the release of. So both of you, both of you are in the same findings here. You both hope there's tapes and recordings. Well, I'm the. I, all I can do is hope. Uh, the, the president surely knows whether he taped me, and if he did, uh, my feelings aren't hurt. Release the entire. Release all the tapes. I'm gotcha. good with it. Gotcha. Sir, uh, do you believe that uh, Robert Mueller, the, our new special um, investigator uh, on Russia, will be thorough and complete without political intervention? And would you be confident on these findings and recommendations? Yes. Bob Mueller is one of the finest people and public servants this country has ever produced. He will do it well. He is a dogged, tough person. And you can have high confidence that when it's done, he's turned over all the rocks. You've been asked a wide variety of, que of questions today, and we're going to be hearing more, I'm sure, in our classified hearing. Uh, something I often ask folks when they come here, uh, what details of this saga would be, uh, should we be focusing on, and what would you recommend us do differently? Hmm. Or to adjust our perspective on this? I don't know. I, one of the reasons that I'm pleased to be here is I think this committee has shown the American people Although we have two parties and we disagree about important things, we can work together when it involves the core interests of the country. So I would hope you'll just keep doing what you're doing. It, it's good in and of itself, but it's also a model, especially for kids, that we, we are a functioning adult democracy. And you also mentioned you had, um, I think, what, uh, six, uh, six meetings, uh, three times in person, six on the phone, nine times in conversation with the president. Did he ever uh, at that time allude that you were not uh, performing adequately? ever indicate that at all? Oh, no. In fact, the contrary, quite often. Yeah, he called me one day. I was about to get on a helicopter. The head of the DEA was waiting in the helicopter for me. And he just called to check in and tell me I was doing an awesome job and wanted to see how I was doing. And I said, I'm doing fine, sir. And then I finished the call and got on the helicopter. Mr. Comey, do you believe you would have been fired if Hillary Clinton had become president? That's a great question. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. you have any thoughts about it? No, I might have been. Uh, I, I don't know. Look, I, I've said before uh, that was an extraordinarily difficult and painful time. I think I did what I had to do. I knew it was going to be very bad for me personally. And the consequence of that might have been, if Hillary Clinton was elected, I might have been terminated. I don't know. I really don't. My final question will be, after February 14th meeting in the Oval Office, you mentioned that you asked Attorney General Sessions to ensure that you were never left alone with the president. Uh, did you ever consider why uh, Attorney General Sessions was not asked to stay in the room? Oh, sure. I did and, and have. And in that moment, I knew. You ever talked to him about it? No. You never had a discussion with, with Jeff Sessions on this? No, not at all. On any of your meetings? No. Uh, I did don't. he inquire? Did he, did he show any inquiry whatsoever? What was that meeting about? No. Oh, it, you're right. I did say to him, I'd forgotten this, when I talked to him and said, you have to be between me and the president, and that's incredibly important, and I forget my exact words, I passed along the president's message about the importance of aggressively pursuing leaks of classified information, which is a, a goal I share, and I passed that along to, to uh, the attorney general, I think it was the next morning, in, our, in a meeting. And, but I did not tell him about the Flynn part. Do you believe this will rise to the obstruction of justice? I don't know. That, that's Bob Mueller's job to sort that out. Thank you, sir.
Mr. Chairman. Senator Cotton. Mr. Comey, you encouraged the President to release the tapes. Will you encourage the Department of Justice or your friend at Columbia or Mr. Mueller to release your memos? Sure. Um, you said that there, you did not record your conversations with President Obama or President Bush in memos. Did you do so with Attorney General Sessions um, or any other senior member of the Trump Department of Justice? No. Did you record? I think it, I'm sorry. Did you record conversations and memos with Attorney General Lynch or any other senior member of the Obama Department of Justice? No, not that I recall. In your statement for the record, you cite nine private conversations with the President, three meetings, and two phone calls. There are four phone calls that are not discussed in your statement for the record. Uh, what happened in those phone calls? The President called me, I believe, shortly before he was inaugurated as a follow-up to our conversation private conversation on January the 6th. He just wanted to reiterate his uh, rejection of the allegation and talk about he thought about it more and why he thought it wasn't true, the, the, uh, the verified and unverified and salacious parts. And, and during that call, he, he asked me, uh, again, hope you're going to stay. You're doing a great job. And I told him that I intended to. There was another phone call that I mentioned, I think was, could have the date wrong, March the 1st where he called just to check in with me as I was about to get on the helicopter. There was a secure call we had about an, op uh, an operational matter that was uh, not related to any of this, about something the FBI was working on. He wanted to make sure that I understood how important he thought it was, a totally appropriate call. And then the fourth call, uh, I'm probably forgetting, may have been the, I may have meant the call when he called to invite me to dinner. I'll think about it as I'm answering other questions, but I think I got that right. Let's uh, turn our attention to the underlying activity at issue here, Russia's uh, hacking into those emails and releasing them and the allegations of collusion. Uh, do you believe Donald Trump colluded with Russia? It's a question I don't think I should answer um, in an open setting. As I said, that we didn't, when I left, we did not have an investigation focused on President Trump. But that's a question that will be answered by the investigation, I think. Let me turn to a couple statements by one of my colleagues, Senator Feinstein. She was the ranking member on this committee until January, which means she had access to information that only she and Chairman Burr did. She's now the senior Democrat on the, Dem on the Judiciary Committee, meaning she has access to the FBI that most of us don't. On May 3rd, uh, on CNN's Wolf Blitzer show, she was asked, do you believe, do you have evidence that there was, in fact, collusion between Trump associates and Russia during the campaign? She answered, not at this time. On May 18th, the same show, Mr. Blitzer said, the last time we spoke, Senator, I asked if you had actually seen any evidence of collusion between the Trump campaign and the Russians, and you said to me, and I'm quoting you now, you said, not at this time. Has anything changed since we last spoke? Senator Feinstein said, well, no, no, it hasn't. Do you have any reason to doubt those statements? I don't doubt that Senator Feinstein was saying what, what she understood. I just don't want to go down that path, first of all, because I'm not in the government anymore, and answering in the negative uh, I just worry leads me deeper and deeper into talking about the investigation in an open setting. I don't, I, I want to be, I'm, I'm always trying to be fair. I don't want to be unfair to President Trump. I'm not trying to suggest by my answer something nefarious, but I don't want to get into the business of saying not as to this person, not as to that person. On uh, February 14th, the New York Times published a story, the headline of which was Trump campaign aides had repeated contacts with Russian intelligence. You were asked earlier if that was uh, an inaccurate story, and you said in the main. Would it be fair to characterize uh, that story as almost entirely wrong? Yes. Uh, did you have, uh, at the time that story was published, any indication of any contact between Trump people and Russians, intelligence officers, other government officials, or close associates of the Russian government? That's one I can't answer sitting here. We can discuss that in a classified setting then. I want to turn uh, attention now to Mr. Flynn uh, and the allegations of his underlying conduct, to be specific, his alleged interactions with the Russian ambassador on the telephone, uh, and then what he said uh, to senior Trump administration officials and Department of Justice officials. I understand there are other issues with Mr. Flynn related to his receipt of foreign monies uh, or disclosure of potential uh, advocacy activity on behalf of foreign governments. Those are serious and credible allegations that I'm sure will be pursued, but I want to speak specifically about his interactions with uh, the Russian ambassador. There was a story on January 23rd in the Washington Post that says, entitled, FBI reviewed Flynn's calls with Russian ambassador 
but found nothing illicit. Is the story accurate? I don't want to comment on that, Senator, because I'm pretty sure the Bureau has not confirmed um, any um, interception of communications. And so I don't want to talk about that in an open setting. Would it be improper for an incoming national security advisor uh, to have a conversation with a foreign ambassador? In my, in my experience, no. Um, but you can't confirm or deny that the conversation happened and we would need to know the contents of that conversation to know if it was in fact improper. Yeah, I don't think I can talk about that in an open setting. I, and again, I've been out of government now a month, so I don't, also don't want to talk about things uh, when it's now somebody else's responsibility, but maybe in the, in the classified setting we can talk more about that. You stated earlier that uh, there was an, an open investigation of Mr. Flynn in the FBI. Uh, did you or any FBI agent ever sense that Mr. Flynn attempted to deceive you or made false statements to an FBI agent? I don't want to go too far. That was the subject of the criminal inquiry. Did you ever come close to closing the investigation on Mr. Flynn? I don't think I can talk about that in an open setting either. We can discuss these more in a closed setting then. Mr. Comey, in, in 2004, you were a part of a well-publicized event about an intelligence program that had been recertified several times, and you were acting Attorney General when Attorney General John Ashcroft uh, was incapacitated due to illness. Um, there was a dramatic showdown at the hospital here. Um, the next day, you said that you wrote a letter of resignation and signed it before you went to meet with President Bush to explain why you refused to certify it. Is that accurate? Yes. At any time in the three and a half months you were the FBI director during the Trump administration, did you ever write and sign a letter of re recommendation and leave it on your desk? Letter of resignation, no, sir. Letter of resignation. No, sir. So despite all of the things that you've testified to here today, you didn't feel this rose to the level of an honest but serious difference of legal opinion between accomplished and skilled lawyers in that 2004 episode? I wouldn't characterize the circumstances in 2004 that way, but to answer, no, I, di I didn't find, encounter any circumstance that led me to intend to resign, consider to resign. No, sir. Thank you. Senator Harris. Director Comey, I want to thank you. You are now a private citizen, and you are enduring a Senate Intelligence <laughs> Committee hearing, um, and each of us gets seven minutes instead of five, as yesterday, to ask you questions, so thank you. No. I'm, I'm between opportunities well, now, so. Well, you're, you, you are. <laughs> I'm sure you'll have future opportunities. You know, you and I are both um, former prosecutors. I'm not going to require you to answer. I just want to make a statement that um, in, in my, um, my uh, experience of prosecuting uh, cases, uh, when a robber held a gun to somebody's head and, and said, I hope you will give me your wallet, the word hope was not the most operative word at that moment, but I'll, you don't have to respond to that point. Um, I have a series of questions to ask you, and, um, and they're going to start with, are you aware of any meetings between the Trump administration officials and Russian officials during the campaign that have not been acknowledged by those officials in the White House? That's not a, even if I remember clearly, that's not a question I can answer in an open setting. Are you aware of any efforts by Trump campaign officials or associates of the campaign to hide their communications with Russian officials through encrypted communications or other means? I have to give you the same answer, Senator. Sure. In the course of the FBI's investigation, did you ever come across anything that suggested that communications records, documents, or other evidence had been destroyed? I think I've got to give you the same answer because it, it would touch on investigative matters. And are you aware of any efforts or potential efforts to conceal communications between campaign officials and Russian officials? I think I have to give you the same answer, Senator. Thank you. Um, as a former Attorney General, I have a series of questions about um, your connection with the Attorney General during the course of your um, tenure as, as Director. What is your understanding of the parameters of um, General Sessions' recusal from the Russia investigation? I think it's described in a written uh, release or statement from DOJ, which I don't remember sitting here, but the gist was he would be recused from all matters relating to uh, Russia and the, and the campaign or activities of Russia and the 16 election, I think, something like that. 
is of the extent of his recusal based on the public statements he's made? Or Correct. The, okay. So was there any kind of memorandum issued from the Attorney General or the Department of Justice to the FBI outlining the parameters of his recusal? Not that I'm aware of. And um, do you know if he reviewed any FBI or DOJ documents pertaining to the investigation before he was recused? I don't. I don't know. And after he was recused? I'm assuming it's the same answer. Same answer. And as a, aside from any notice or memorandum that was not sent or was, what mechanism or processes were in place to ensure that the Attorney General would not have any connection with the investigation, to your knowledge? I don't know for sure. I know that he had consulted with career ethics officials that know how to run a recusal at DOJ, but I don't know what mechanism they set up. And the Attorney General uh, recused himself from the investigation, but do you believe it was appropriate for him to be involved in the firing of the um, chief investigator of that case, of that in Russia interference? That's something I can't answer sitting here. It's a, it's a reasonable question, but that would depend on a lot of things I don't know. Like, what did he know? What was he told? Did he realize that the president was doing it because of the Russia investigation? Things like that. I just don't know the answer. You've mentioned um, in your written testimony in here that the president essentially asked you for a loyalty pledge. Are you aware of him making the same request of any other members of the cabinet? I am not. Do you know one way or another what he I what don't he know did? one way or another. I've never heard anything about it. And um, you mentioned that on uh, you had the conversation where he hoped that you would let the Flynn matter go on February 14th uh, or thereabouts. It's my understanding that um, Mr. Sessions was recused from any involvement in the investigation about a full two weeks later. To your knowledge, was the Attorney General, um, did he have access to information about the investigation in those interim two weeks? I, I don't, I, in theory, sure, because he's the Attorney General, I don't know whether he had any contact with any materials related to that. To your knowledge, was there any directive that he should not have any contact with any information about the Russian investigation between the February 14th date and the day he was ultimately recused or recused himself on March 2nd? Not to my knowledge. I don't know one way or another. And did you speak to the Attorney General about the Russia investigation before his recusal? I don't think so, no. Do you know if anyone in the department, in the FBI, um, uh, forwarded any documents or information or memos of any sort uh, to the attention of the Attorney General before his recusal? I don't, I don't know of any or remember any sitting here. It's possible, but I, I don't remember any. Do you know if the Attorney General was involved, in fact involved, in any aspect of the Russia investigation after his recusal on the uh, 2nd of March? I don't. I would assume not, but I don't. I don't. Well, let me say it this way. I don't know of any information that would lead me to believe he did something to touch the Russia investigation after the recusal. In your written testimony, you indicate that uh, you, uh, when you, after you were left alone with the president, you mentioned that it was inappropriate and should not, never happen again to the attorney general. And apparently, he did not reply. And you write that he did not reply. What did he do, if anything? Did he just look at you? Was there a pause for a moment? What happened? I, I don't remember real clearly. I, I have a recollection of him just kind of looking at me. And there's a danger here I'm projecting onto him. So this may be a faulty memory. But I kind of got his body language gave me the sense like, what am I going to do? Did he shrug? I, I don't remember clearly. I think the reason I have that impression is I have some recollection of almost imperceptible like, what am I going to do? But I, I don't have a clear recollection of that. He didn't say anything. And on that same February 14th meeting, um, you said you understood the president to be requesting that you drop the investigation. After that meeting, however, you received two calls from the president, March 30th and April 11th, where the president talked about a cloud over his presidency. Has anything you've learned in the months since your February 14th meeting changed your understanding of the president's request? I guess it would be what he has said pub in public documents or public interviews? Correct. Okay. And is there anything um, about this investigation that you believe is um, in any way uh, biased or is, is, is not being informed by a, a process of seeking the truth? No. The, the appointment of a special counsel should offer great, especially given who that person is, great comfort to Americans, no matter what your political uh, affiliation is, that this will be done independently, competently, and honestly. And do you believe that he should have full authority, Mr. Mueller, 
um, to be able to pursue that investigation. Yes, and, I, and knowing him well uh, over the years, if there's something that he thinks he needs, he will, he will speak up about it. Do you believe he should have full independence? Oh, yeah. And he wouldn't be part of it if he wasn't going to get full independence. Thank you. Senator Cornyn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Comey, uh, I'll repeat what I've said at uh, previous hearings, that I believe you're a good and decent man who's been dealt a very difficult hand, uh, starting back uh, with the Clinton email investigation. And I appreciate your willingness to appear here today voluntarily and answer our questions and cooperate uh, with our investigation. As a general matter, if an FBI agent has reason to believe that a crime has been committed, do they have a duty to report it? That's a good question. I don't know that there's a legal duty to report it. They certainly have a cultural, ethical duty to report it. You're unsure whether they would have a legal duty? Yeah, that's a good question. I've not thought of it before. I don't know where the legal, there's a statute that prohibits misprision of a felony, knowing of a felony, and taking steps to conceal it. But this is a different question. And so look, let me be clear. I would expect any FBI agent who has reason, information about a crime being committed to report it. Me too. But, the, but where you rest that obligation, I don't know. It exists. And let me ask you as a general proposition, if you're trying to make an investigation go away, is firing an FBI director a good way to make that happen? By that, I mean... Yeah, it doesn't make doesn't, a lot of sense to me, but I'm, I'm obviously hopelessly biased, uh, given that I was the one fired. I understand it's uh, personal. No, given the nature of the FBI, I meant what I said. There's no indispensable people in the world, including at the FBI, that there's lots of bad things about me not being at the FBI. Most of them are for me, but the work's going to go on as before. So nothing that's happened that you've testified to here today has impeded the investigation of the FBI or Director Mueller's um, commitment to get to the bottom of this from the standpoint of the FBI and the uh, Department of Justice. Would you agree with that? Correct. Especially the appointment of Director, former Director Mueller is a critical part of that equation. Let me take you back to the Clinton email investigation. I think um, you've been cast as a hero or a villain, depending on the, uh, whose political ox is being gored, uh, at many different times during the course of the Clinton email investigation and even even now, perhaps. But um, you clearly were troubled by the conduct of the sitting attorney general, Loretta Lynch, when it came to the Clinton email investigation. You mentioned the characterization that you'd been asked to accept that this was a matter and not a criminal investigation, which you said it, it was. There was the matter of President Clinton's um, meeting on the tarmac uh, with the sitting attorney general at a time when his wife was a subject to a criminal investigation, and you suggested that perhaps there are other matters that you may be able to share with us later on in a classified setting. But it seems to me that you clearly believe that Loretta Lynch, the attorney general, had a, an appearance of a conflict of interest on the Clinton email investigation. Is that correct? I think that's fair. I didn't believe she could credibly decline that investigation at least not without grievous damage to the Department of Justice and to the FBI. And under Department of Justice and FBI norms, wouldn't it have been appropriate for the Attorney General, or if she had recused herself, which she did not do, for the Deputy Attorney General to uh, appoint a special counsel? That's essentially what's happened now with Director Mueller. Would that have been an appropriate step in the Clinton email investigation, in yes, your opinion? Certainly a possible step, yes, sir. And were you aware that uh, Ms. Lynch had been requested numerous times to appoint a special counsel and had refused? From, yes, from, I think, Congress had, members of Congress had repeatedly asked. Yes, sir. Yours truly uh, okay. did on multiple occasions. And that heightened your concerns about the appearance of a conflict of interest with the Department of Justice, which caused you to make what you have described as an incredibly painful decision to basically take the matter up yourself and led to that uh, July uh, press conference. Yes, sir. I can say after the President Clinton, former President Clinton, uh, met on the plane with the Attorney General, I considered whether I should call for the appointment of a special counsel. 
and I decided that that would be an unfair thing to do because I knew there was no case there. We had investigated it very, very thoroughly. I know this is a subject of passionate disagreement, but I knew there was no case there, and calling for the appointment of special counsel would be brutally unfair because it would send the message, aha, there's something here. That was my judgment. Again, lots of people have different views of it, but that's how I thought about it. Well, if the special counsel had been appointed, they could have made that determination uh, that there was nothing there and uh, declined to pursue it, right? Sure, but it would have been many months later or a year later. Let me just ask you to, uh, given the experience of the Clinton email investigation and what happened there, do you think it's unreasonable for anyone, any president, who has been assured on multiple occasions that he's not the subject of an FBI investigation, do you think it's unreasonable for them to want the FBI director to publicly announce that so that this cloud over his administration would be removed? I think that's a reasonable point of view. The concern would be obviously because that boomerang comes back, it's uh, going to be a very big deal because there will be a duty to correct. Well, we, we saw that in the uh, Clinton email investigation, of yes, course. Yes, I recall that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I know you do. Um, so let me ask you f finally in the minute that we have left, there was this conversation back and forth about loyalty, and I think we all appreciate the fact that an FBI director is a unique public official in the sense that he's not, he's a political appointee in one sense, but he has a duty of independence to pursue the law pursuant to the, his, the Constitution and laws of the United States. And so when the President asked you about loyalty, you got in this back and forth about, well, I'll pledge you my honesty. And then it looks like, from what I've read, you agreed upon honest loyalty or something like that. Is that the characterization? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Senator Reid. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Director Comey. Uh, there have been uh, press reports that the President, uh, in addition to asking you to drop the Flynn investigation, has asked other senior uh, intelligence officials to take steps uh, which would tend to undermine the investigation into Russia. Uh, there's been reports that he's asked DNI Coates and Admiral Rogers to make public statements uh, exonerating him or, or, or taking the pressure off him, and also reports about Admiral Rogers and Director Pompeo to intervene and reach out to the FBI and ask them. Are you aware of any of these, uh, or do you have any information with respect to any of these for allegations? I don't. I'm aware of the public reporting, but I had no contact, no conversation with any of those leaders about that subject. Thank you. Uh, you have testified that uh, you interpret the discussion with the President about Flynn as a direction to stop the investigation. Is that correct? Yes. You've testified that the President asked you to lift the cloud uh, by essentially making public statements exonerating him and perhaps others. You refused, correct? I didn't. I didn't do it. I didn't refuse the, pre the, the president. I told him we would see what we could do, and then the second time he called, I told him, in substance, that's something your lawyer will have to take up with the Justice right. Department. And part of the underlying logic was that, was we've discussed uh, many times throughout this morning, is the duty to correct. Uh, that is one of the, a theoretical issue, but also a very practical issue. It, it, was there your feeling that the direction of the investigation could, in fact, include the president? Well, in, in theory, I mean, as I explained, the concern of one of my senior leader colleagues was, if you're looking at potential coordination between the campaign and Russia, the person at the head of the campaign is the candidate. So logically, this person argued, the, the candidate's knowledge, understanding, will logically become a part of your inquiry if it proceeds. And so I understood that argument. Uh, my view was that, that what I said to the President was accurate and fair and fair to him. I resisted the idea of publicly saying it, although if the Justice Department had wanted to, that I would have done it, because of the duty to correct and the slippery slope problem. 
Uh, and again, also, you've testified that the, the President asked you repeatedly to be loyal to him, and you responded you would be honestly loyal, which is, I think, your way of saying, I'll be honest and I'll be the head of the FBI and independent. Is that fair? Correct. I tried honest first, um, and also, I mean, you see it in my testimony, I also tried to explain to him why it's in his interest right. and every President's interest for the FBI to be a part, in a way, because its credibility is important uh, to a president and to the country. And so I tried to hold the line, hold the line. It got very awkward. And I then said, uh, you'll always have honesty from me. He said, honest loyalty. And then I acceded to that as a way to end this awkwardness. At the culmination of all these events, you're summarily fired without any explanation or anything else. Well, there was an explanation. I just don't buy it. Well, uh, yes. So you're fired. So do you believe that you were fired because you, you refused to, to, to take the president's direction? Is that the ultimate reason? I don't know for sure. I know I was fired. Again, I take the president's words. I know I was fired because of something about the way I was conducting the Russia investigation, was in some way putting pressure on him, in some way irritating him, and he decided to fire me because of that. No. I, I, I can't go farther than that. The Russian investigation, as you have pointed out, and as all my colleagues have reflected, is one of the most serious hostile acts against this country in our history, undermining the very core of our democracy and our elections. It is not a discrete event. It will likely occur. It's probably being prepared now for 18 and 20 and beyond. And yet, the President of the United States fires you because, in your own words, some relation to this investigation. And then he shows up in the Oval Office with the Russian Foreign Minister, first after classifying you as crazy and a real nut job, which I think you've effectively disproved this morning. Uh, he said, I face great pressure because of Russia. That's taken off. Uh, your conclusion would be that the President, I would think, is downplaying the seriousness of this threat. In fact, uh, took s specific steps to stop uh, a thorough investigation of the Russian, investi uh, Russian influence. And also, from what you've said or what was been said this morning, doesn't seem to be particularly interested in these hostile threats by the Russians. Is that fair? I don't know that I can uh, agree to that level of detail. There's no doubt that it's a fair judgment, it's my judgment, that I was fired because of the Russia investigation. I was fired in some way to change or the Thank you, Ralph. He said we got 81% of the vote. I want to know who are the 19 percent? Who are they? Where do they come from? Thank you, Ralph, for that really kind introduction and for your great leadership. It's wonderful to be back here with all of my friends. It is the fifth time. Who would have known this was going to happen? But we had a feeling, didn't we?
In the case of uh, Hillary Clinton, you made the statement that there wasn't uh, sufficient evidence to reach a conclusion in that case that it was not uh, necessary to further pursue her. Yet at the same time, in the case of Mr. Comey, you said that there was not enough information to make a conclusion. Tell me the difference between your conclusion as far as former Secretary Clinton is concerned and and Mr. Mr. Trump. The Clinton investigation was a completed investigation that uh, the FBI had been deeply involved in, and so I had an opportunity to understand all the facts and apply those facts against the laws I understood them. This investigation was underway, still going when I was fired. So it's nowhere near in the same place. At least it wasn't when I was. But it's still ongoing. Correct. As so far as I know, it was when I left. That investigation was going on. This investigation is going on. That one was done. That, uh, that, I only that investigation of any involvement of Secretary Clinton or any of her associates is completed? Yes, as of July the 5th, the FBI completed its investigative work, and that's what I was announcing, what we had done and what we had found. Well, at least in the minds of this member, there's a whole lot of questions remaining about what went on, particularly considering the fact that, as you mentioned, it's a, quote, big deal as to what went on during the campaign. So I'm glad you concluded that part of the investigation, but I, I, I think that the American people have a whole lot of questions out there, particularly since you just emphasized the role that Russia played. And obviously, she was a candidate. time, so she was clearly involved in this whole situation where fake news, uh, as you just described it, big deal, uh, took place. And, uh, you, you're going to have to help me out here. You, in other words, the investigation of anything that former Secretary Clinton had to do with the campaign is over and we don't have to worry about it anymore? With respect to Secretary, I'm not, I'm, I'm a little confused, Senator. With respect to Secretary Clinton, yeah. we investigated criminal investigation in connection with her use of a personal email server. I understand. And that's the investigation I announced the conclusion of on July 5th. So, but there, at the same time, you made the announcement there would be no f charges brought against uh, then Secretary Clinton uh, for any activities involved in the Russia involvement in our engagement in our uh, election. I don't, I don't quite understand how you could be done with that, but not complete, done with the whole investigation of their attempt to affect the outcome of our election. No, I'm sorry. I, we're not, at least when I left, when I was fired on May the 9th, there was still an open, active investigation to understand the Russian efforts and whether any Americans work with them. But you the, reached the conclusion that there was no reason to bring charges against Secretary Clinton. So you reached a conclusion. In the case of Mr. Comey, you, uh, the President uh, Comey, I mean, no, sir. me, in the case of President Trump, you uh, have an ongoing investigation. So you got one candidate who you're done with and another candidate that you have a long way to go. Is that correct? I don't know how far the, the FBI has to go, but yes, that the Clinton email investigation was completed. The investigation of Russia's efforts in connection with the election and whether there was any coordination, and if so, with whom, you between Russia it, and the campaign, you just was ongoing it, when I left. You just made it clear in what you said. This is a, quote, big deal, unquote. Uh, I, I think it's hard to reconcile. In one case, you reach a complete conclusion, and the other side, you have, you have not. And you, uh, in fact, obviously, there's a lot more there, as, as we know, as you called it, a, quote, big deal. She's one of the candidates. But in her case, you say there would be no charges. And in the case 
of uh, President Trump, the, res the investigation continues. What has been brought out in this uh, hearing is, uh, is more and more emphasis on the Russian engagement and involvement in this campaign. How, how serious do you think this was? Very serious, but I, I want to say some, be clear. It was, we have not announced, and there was no predication to announce, an investigation of whether the Russians may have coordinated with Secretary Clinton's campaign. Secretary Clinton's campaign. No, but they may not have been involved with their campaign. They were involved with the entire presidential campaign, obviously. Of course. Yes, sir. And that, that is an investigation. That began last summer and, so far as I'm aware, continues. So both President Trump and former candidate Clinton are both involved in the investigation, yet one of them, you said, there's going to be no charges, and the other one, the, the investigation continues. Our April 11th phone call, and he said, quote, because I've been very loyal to you, very loyal. We had that thing, you know. Did that arouse your curiosity as what, quote, that thing was? Yes. Why didn't you ask him? It didn't seem to me to be important for the conversation we were having to understand it. I took it to be some... Um, an effort to, to uh, communicate to me this, that there is a relationship between us where I've been good to you, you should be good to me. Yeah, but I, I think it would intensely arouse my <coughs> curiosity if uh, the President of the United States said, we had that thing, you know. I'd like to know what the hell that thing is, particularly if I'm the director of the FBI. Yeah, I, I get that, Senator. Honestly, I'll tell you what, this is speculation, but what I concluded at the time is in his memory he was searching back to our encounter at the dinner and was preparing himself to say, I offered loyalty to you, you promised loyalty to me, and all the memory showed him that did not happen, and I think he pulled up short. That's just a guess, but I, I, a lot of conversations with humans over the years. I think I would have had some curiosity if it had been about me, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, so are you aware anything that would believe you to believe that the that's a subject for investigations not something i can comment on sitting here but you reached that conclusion as far as secretary clinton was concerned but you're not reaching a conclusion as far as this administration is concerned uh, are you aware of anything that would lead you to believe that information exists that could uh, coerce members of the administration or blackmail the administration? That's not a question I can answer, Senator. <laughs> Senator's time's expired. Thank you. All time's expired for the hearing. Can I say for members, uh, we'll reconvene promptly at 1 p.m. Uh, in the hearing room. We have a vote scheduled for 1.45. I would suggest that all members promptly um, be there at 1 o'clock. We have about three minutes. I'd like to have order. Photographers, photographers return to where you were, please. This hearing's not adjourned yet. Either that or we'll remove you. To members, we have about three minutes of updates that we would love to cover as soon as we get into the closed session before we have an opportunity to spend uh, some time with uh, Director Comey. Uh, based on our agreement, it would be my intentions to adjourn that closed hearing between 2 and 2.10 so that members can go vote, and I would uh, urge you to eat at that time. Jim, um, several of us on this committee have had the opportunity to work with you since you walked in the door. I want to say personally on behalf of all this, uh, all the committee members, we're grateful to you for your service to your, your country, not just in the capacity as FBI director, uh, but as prosecutor and, more importantly, being somebody that loves this country enough to tell it like it is. I, I want to say to your workforce that we're grateful to them with the level of cooperation that they have shown us, with the trust we've built uh, between both organizations, the Congress and, and the Bureau, uh, we couldn't do our job if it wasn't for their willingness to share candidly with us the work that we need uh, to see. 
This hearing is the ninth public hearing this committee has had this year. That is twice the historical year-long average of this committee. I think the Vice Chairman and my biggest challenge when this investigation has concluded is to return our hearings uh, to the secrecy of a closed hearing, um, to encourage our members not to freely talk about intelligence matters publicly, and to respect the fact that we have a huge job. And that's to represent the entire body of the United States Senate and the American people, to make sure that we work with the intelligence community to provide you the tools to keep America safe, and that you do it within the legal limit or those limits that are set by the executive branch. Uh, we could not do it if it wasn't for a tr trusted partnership that you have been able to lead and others before you. So as, as we depart from this, this is a pivotal uh, hearing in our investigation. Uh, we're grateful to you for the professionalism you've shown and your willingness. I will turn to the Vice Chairman. I simply want to echo, uh, one again, the thanks uh, for your appearance. And there are clearly still remain a number of questions. And the one thing I want to commit to you, and more importantly, I think, Chairman, I want to commit to all those who are still potentially watching and following. There's still a lot of unanswered questions, and we're going to get to the bottom of this. We're going to get the facts out. The American people deserve to know. Uh, there is the questions around implications of Trump officials and the Russians, but there's also the macro issue of what the Russians did and continue to do. And I think it is very important that all Americans...